today we are going to talk about drugs used in treatment of hypertension right we have already discussed the normal regulation of blood pressure in physiology and we have already discussed the causes and mechanisms of hypertension in series of lectures in pathology right so today we'll be talking about what is the what are the drugs which are used in hypertension but before we really talk about the drugs i would like to stress one thing that if a patient come with mild hypertension first we should try non pharmacological ways of management of hypertension when we talk about the management of hypertension principal principal number one is that if there is a cause of hypertension that must be eliminated you know there is essential hypertension and there is secondary hypertension essential hypertension is without any well defined cause in the body and secondary hypertension is a type of hypertension in which there is some underlying disease process which is producing hypertension and in secondary hypertension if you remove the cause of hypertension blood pressure will come down usually is that clear right now when we talk about the management of hypertension as i told you principle number 1 is if there is an underlying cause that must be removed number 2 is if there is mild hypertension you must try first non pharmacological method so what are the non pharmacological methods non pharmacological methods of reducing blood pressure right now who will tell me what are the non pharmacological methods of reducing blood pressure number one is that actually you have to change the lifestyle of the patient right for example exercise physical exercise regular physical exercise that reduces blood pressure right especially if patient is under stressful circumstances and he is doing regular physical exercise right his capability to handle the stress becomes better and his blood pressure goes down slightly then in some selected patients salt restriction right and there should not be absolute salt restriction what we really say that patient can take salt which is present in the food but salt should not be further added on the table to the food right number 3 if patient is obese then weight loss if patient is obese weight loss also reduces your blood pressure then you have to avoid yes smoking because blood pressure related complications especially related with the atherosclerosis are enhanced by smoking right then there is what about alcohol it should be increased or decreased right moderation in alcohol right there is recent studies that uh, ethanol in very small amount may be good for your heart right but of course excess is bad uh, why alcohol is dangerous because it irritates the nerve endings and increases a sympathetic nerve endings and takes the blood pressure up what other non pharmacological method you know yes relaxation techniques and biofeedback relaxation especially if a person is under stressful circumstances right he has to change his lifestyle if he is under he has a very stressful job and his blood pressure is high if he finds a job which is less stressful maybe his blood pressure come down right so management of stress or avoidance of stress is a better thing then what else we are talking about non pharmacological management of hypertension that patient should have a healthier lifestyle right lifestyle modifications in which physical exercise should be regularly done they say at least uh, 20 to 30 minutes 3 days a week right exercise salt restriction weight loss if person is obese smoking should be avoided rather better to stop alcohol should be moderation in alcohol intake then relaxation techniques and biofeedback and then potassium rich diets one of the latest research is that potassium rich diets potassium is rich in which which type of diets bananas. Yeah, bananas fruits and then the most important thing we did not talk about you have to manage the 
blood lipids even because hypertension produces atherosclerosis even hyperlipidemia also produce complications of atherosclerosis is that right so lipid management right that blood lipids to reduce so what you have to do to reduce the blood lipids number one that red meat should be avoided is that right it increases the uh, cholesterol in your blood right red meat should be avoided right so this is the basic few points related with pharmacological and non pharmacological management of hypertension now i will talk about the principles of pharmacological management of hypertension before i really start that how the different drugs change the different parameters physiological parameters related with blood pressure i will briefly review what are the normal physiological parameters which control your blood pressures is that right your blood pressure yes your blood pressure is mainly dependent on what who will tell me blood pressure is mainly dependent on two parameters because those two parameters if they are managed by the drugs your blood pressure will be reduced basically your blood pressure depends on cardiac output and total peripheral resistance total peripheral resistance right especially total peripheral resistance is very important as far as diastolic blood pressure is concerned diastolic blood pressure is concerned total peripheral resistance and cardiac output is especially important in case of systolic blood pressure these things are discussed in big detail in lectures in physiology but i will very briefly tell you that how the total peripheral resistance control the diastolic blood pressure and how the cardiac output controls the systolic blood pressure because later on i will tell you there are some drugs which reduce the cardiac output so they will mainly reduce systolic blood pressure and there are other drugs which mainly reduce total peripheral resistance so naturally the drugs which reduce total peripheral resistance they will mainly reduce diastolic blood pressure now let's suppose this is your left ventricle right and this is your aorta or major artery and here are arteries and arteries are eventually dividing into yes arterioles is that right now here is your what are these these are your capillaries isn't it these are your capillaries capillary beds and here is your yes please venous drainage venules and eventually venous system going back to the right heart now you know blood pressure is measured in the major vessels blood pressure we measure in the brachial artery right and you know there is there is something called systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure for example we say that a part, this person has systolic blood pressure of 120 mm of mercury and diastolic blood pressure of 80 mm of mercury what does this mean this statement means that systolic blood pressure is 120 and diastolic blood pressure is 80 the statement means that when left ventricle is contracting the maximum pressure maximum pressure in the major vessel is 120 systolic blood pressure means that during the peak of the systole when left ventricle is contracting the maximum pressure which is present in the major systemic arteries is 120 mm of mercury and when left ventricle is relaxing of course when left ventricle is relaxing aortic valve closes when left ventricle is relaxing aortic valve closes can blood go back no blood cannot go back can it move forward answer is yes yes is that right now during the diastole when left ventricle is relaxing blood present in major arteries cannot go back but through the arterioles it can move forward to the 
capillaries and to the venous side. Is that right? Now listen carefully. When left ventricle is relaxing, whatever is the pressure, the lowest pressure which is present in the major arteries, that pressure is called? Yes, diastolic blood pressure. So what is the definition of systolic blood pressure? Systolic blood pressure is the pre uh, blood pressure present in the major systemic arteries when left, left ventricle is at the peak of systole. Is that right? Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure present in the major systemic arteries when left ventricle is relaxing. Is that right? Now we will see that what are the factors which determine the systolic blood pressure and what are the factors mainly which determine the diastolic blood pressure. Right. I have already said that diastolic blood pressure mainly depends on, yes, mainly depends on total peripheral resistance. Let me tell you how. Let us suppose that when left ventricle is relaxing and there is diastole, let us suppose pressure at that very moment here is 80 millimeter of mercury. Now, what is total peripheral resistance? Total peripheral resistance is the total resistance offered by the arterioles to the movement of the blood from the arterial side to the venous side. Again, let me redefine what is total peripheral resistance. Total peripheral resistance is the resistance offered by all the arterioles put together against the flow of the blood from arterial side to the venous side. Is that right? That is total peripheral resistance. Now listen carefully. Let us suppose if I give a drug which is arteriolo-constrictor. Let's suppose I give a drug and these are arterioles and after that drug these arterioles constrict and if these arterioles become narrow do you think during the diastole blood can move easily forward? No. no. It means blood will be kept over here and if blood is kept over here it means pressure here will be high. So what did we do? That we gave a drug which was arteriolo constrictor and arteriolo constrictor drug increases total peripheral resistance and when you increase the total peripheral resistance then blood from the arterial side is having more resistance to move to the venous side so more blood is kept in the major arteries during the diastole and pressure during the diastole will go up. Now we do another experiment. Let us suppose we give another drug which is arteriolo dilator. We do the reverse. We give another drug which will op open these arterioles. If these arterioles are opened up, what will happen? That during the diastole, blood will rapidly move forward. Because when these arterioles will open, there will be less resistance for the movement of the blood from arterial side to the venous side. Is that right? So with arterial load dilatation, we say that there is reduced total peripheral resistance and whenever total peripheral resistance is reduced then movement of the blood from major systemic arteries to venous side is increased and what really happens pressure here drop. So by these two experiments what did we learn? That if we, per, if we increase total peripheral resistance diastole blood pressure will go up and if we decrease total peripheral resistance diastole blood pressure will go down. So what did we learn up to now? The diastolic blood pressure is mainly dependent on total peripheral resistance. Diastolic blood pressure is mainly dependent on total peripheral resistance. Now let's develop the concept that systolic blood pressure is mainly dependent on cardiac output. Let us suppose in this patient diastolic blood pressure is 80. Now left ventricle start contraction. Of course, when left ventricle will start systole, which valve will open? Aortic valve will open and now blood will rapidly move to the arterial side. Now this blood during systole, the amount of blood which is coming during the systole to the arterial tray, it will take the pressure there upward, right? At the peak of the systole, the maximum pressure 
which is seen in arterial tree is called systolic pressure. Of course, if, if cardiac output is more, it means more blood is coming during systole here, systolic blood pressure will go up. And if cardiac output is less, it means less blood is ejected to the arterial tree. So during the systole, because less blood is coming, so systolic blood pressure will be less. Is it clear to everyone? Just a little test and then we'll move forward. I give to this person a drug which is arteriolo constriction. What will happen to total peripheral resistance? Increase. It will increase. What will happen to diastolic blood pressure? Increase. If I give arteriolo dilator, what will happen to total peripheral resistance? Decrease. What will happen to diastolic blood pressure? Decrease. Fine. If I give a drug which increases cardiac output, what will happen to systolic blood pressure? Increase. increase. If I give a drug which reduces cardiac output, what will happen to systolic blood pressure? Decrease. decrease. This concept clear? It means when we'll talk about antihypertensive drugs which mainly regulate arteriolar tone, they mainly affect diastolic blood pressure. And when we talk about the drugs which mainly change the cardiac output, those drugs mainly change systolic blood pressure. Is that right? Now let's take this concept a little ahead. Now, total uh, cardiac output depends on which factor? Again, listen. Just a minute. I'm going to discuss now, we know that systolic blood pressure depends on cardiac output, but cardiac output depends on which parameters? Right? Number one is, yes, number one is cardiac output depends on, yes, contractility. Contractility. That if left ventricle has better contractility, cardiac output is more. And if left ventricle has poor contractility, cardiac output is less. So it means cardiac output depends, number one, on the state of contractility of the left ventricle. Is that right? Number two, it means if we give positive inotropic drug, contractility will increase and cardiac output will increase and systolic blood pressure will increase. And if we give negative inotropic drug, then contractility will decrease. Then cardiac output will decrease and systolic blood pressure will decrease. Second thing, cardiac output depends not only on the contractility, it depends on one more factor. Yeah, cardiac output depends on, okay, let me make it more simple. Just a minute. First, we'll make it in a more simple way that cardiac output depends on stroke volume and heart rate. And stroke volume depends on three things. One of that is, what is that? Contractility. Right? So we were talking about that if we give a drug which increases contractility, that increases stroke volume, that increases cardiac output, that increases systolic blood pressure. Is that right? If we want to bring the systolic blood pressure down, one of the ways should be that reduce contractility. If you reduce the contractility, that will reduce the stroke volume and reduce the cardiac output and reduce the systolic blood pressure. Any question here? No. Another factor which determines the stroke volume is the preload. What is your concept of preload? Of course, there is another thing which is called afterload. And here was the parameter which was called contractility. Now, stroke volume depends on contractility, but it also depends on preload. What is preload? Yeah, what is preload? Preload is the load of blood. It is the load of blood in the ventricle on which ventricle is going to produce contraction. That is the volume of blood present in the ventricle at the end of diastole and diastolic volume. If end diastolic volume is more, if end diastolic volume is more, it means ventricle is overfilled. Frank Starling say, more you fill the ventricle, more it stretch and more it contract. And if you fill the ventricle less, it contract less. Is that right? Now, 
it means number one what is preload preload is the volume of the blood present in the ventricle just before systole and contractility is working on the preload of course if there is no blood can it eject anything no but if there is more blood it will contract strongly so it means that your stroke volume depends not only on the contractility but it also depends that just before the contractility what was the amount of blood which was present within the ventricle is that clear when ventricles have more more blood they contract strongly when they have less blood they contract weakly is that right according to frank starling's law more you put in the heart more it stretches more it contracts is that right now so what is preload Preload is the end diastolic, end diastolic volume, volume of the blood which left ventricle has just before contraction. Is that right? Now, what is after load? What is after load? After load is the resistance against which left ventricle will pump. Look, preload is the amount of blood it has just before contraction. So preload is the load on which heart will work. After load is the resistance against which stroke volume is pushed. Is that right? So what is the resistance against outflow? Total peripheral resistance. What is the resistance? For example, left ventricle is contracting. It has to push the blood in arterial tree against a resistance. What is this resistance? This resistance. Total peripheral resistance. Total peripheral resistance. Now listen carefully. Let us suppose that if I increase the venous accumulation here, if venous blood accumulate a lot here, if lot of blood accumulate here, then we say preload is more. If preload is more, then stroke volume is more. And if stroke volume is more, then cardiac output is more. And then systolic blood pressure is more, right? Now, Again, what are the factors which determine preload? Because in the management of hypertension, we need to reduce the preload. What is the basic principle? In a patient who has systolic hypertension, if you reduce the preload, you reduce the stroke volume, you reduce the cardiac output, you reduce the systolic blood pressure. Now the question is that preload depends on what? Preload means the blood which is going to the filling here through the lungs of course. The blood which is filling here during the diastole, that is determining the preload. Is that right? Now preload depends on what? Number one, veno motor tone, veno motor tone, I will explain it. Let's suppose your veins constrict, if your veins constrict, they will push a lot of blood to the left heart, through the right heart of course. If you if I give a patient a drug which will constrict the veins, it means venomotor tone is going up. And if venomotor tone goes up, blood is squeezed from the venous side to the left ventricle, first right ventricle through the lungs to the left ventricle. So left ventricle will be underfilled, overfilled. And cardiac output will be again overfilled. Preload will be more. Stroke volume will be more. Cardiac output will be more. Systolic blood pressure will be more. Opposite to that, if I give a drug which is venodilator, which reduces venomotor tone, a drug which is venodilator, if veins dilate, then they retain the blood. So venous return is reduced. Then naturally ventricular filling is reduced. End diastolic volume is reduced. Stroke volume is reduced. Cardiac output is reduced. And systolic blood pressure is less. Are you understanding? Later on I will tell you this drug is venodilator. You should think what it will do. Is that right? Am I clear? Then venous return depends on one more factor. Venous return depends on one more factor. That is the total blood volume. If your body has total body fluids more or total blood volume is more, then of course venous return will be more and end diastolic volume will be more and stroke volume will be more and cardiac output will be more and eventually what will happen? That systolic blood pressure will be high. Is that right? Now, 
having said all of this, I will write down all these things on the side and then I will draw a diagram and we will talk about that how different classes of antihypertensive drugs modify different parameters of blood pressure regulation. You know there are physiological parameters of blood pressure regulation and antihypertensive drugs are pharmacological methods of modifying the modifying the physiological parameters of the blood pressure regulation and blood pressure should alter. Now, we will, once you have learned all this thing, right, we go to the antihypertensive drugs and I will talk about now how different antihypertensive drugs alter your blood pressure, right? Again, first, just before moving ahead, there's a little test. Yes, blood pressure depends on what? Just please, two main things. Cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. Cardiac output is depending, uh, managing what? Systolic, tolic, blood pressure. And total peripheral resistance is managing which blood pressure? Diastolic. Is that clear? Of course. Now you rapidly tell me. Cardiac output depends on which three factors? Rapidly? Yeah, first of all, basic two factors. Stroke volume and heart rate. Right? If you increase heart rate, cardiac output is more, systolic blood pressure is more. If you decrease heart rate, cardiac output is less and systolic blood pressure is less. Stroke volume depends on what? Preload? Yes. After load? Yes. And? Contractility and preload depends on what? Yes. Preload is mainly end diastolic volume. It depends on what? Preload or end diastolic volume or left ventricular filling depends on total blood volume. Total blood volume, veno, motor, tone. And one very delicate point. What is that? One more factor. Diastolic duration. Because during the diastole, blood is filling in the ventricle. Is that right? If diastole is long, if diastole is long, then filling times are more. And if diastole is short, then filling times are less. So basically, diastolic time also determines end diastolic volume. And diastolic time depends on heart rate. Because when your heart rate increases, diastole, diastole shrink. And when your heart rate decreases, diastole expands. Do you know that or not? If you don't know, I can explain that. You know that. Very good. Now, after discuss all this, let's go to the basic things. That how the different types of antihypertensive drugs work. Is that right? So let's start. Here is your... Which heart is this? Right heart. And which heart is this? Left heart, right? Of course, right heart is taking blood to the lungs. And in the lungs, blood will pass through, suppose here you have a green lung, right? Okay. So blood will pass through the capillaries and then through the lungs capillary, right? What is this? Pulmonary right. artery and then blood will collect into pulmonary veins and pulmonary veins will bring the blood to left heart. Is that right? This is the venous filling, right? Now. Then what is happening, that these are your major arterial tree and from here through the arterioles, yes, blood is going to systemic, yes, circulation to the capillaries and from the capillaries, blood will pass to the, yes, venous side and from the venous side, Eventually, blood will go back to the, yes, right, 
heart. I will specially draw here kidney because that plays a very important role in management of blood pressure, right? I will draw here a nephron. Of course, one kidney has how many nephrons? Millions of the nephron, 1.2 million. But I'm making just one nephron, right? And let's suppose from arterial side, this is renal arterial blood coming, passing through the kidney, and then venous blood going back. Is that right? Any question up to this? There are the lungs here, there's kidney here, this represents rest of the systemic circulation, right? <coughs> and we have to see how the drugs work on this system to bring the blood pressure down, right? And you should not forget there is something called, what is it? Yes, central nervous system, right, which regulates the blood pressure also. The important relationship here is that there are vasomotor centers in medulla, reticular formation, from where sympathetic fibers are coming down. And these sympathetic fibers stimulate the preganglionic sympathetic outflow from T1 to L2. Is that right? And these are preganglionic sympathetic fibers. Then these are the postganglionic sympathetic fibers. They are going and stimulating heart. Postganglionic sympathetic fibers. Then some of them are going and stimulating the smooth muscles of veins. Is that right? Some of these sympathetic fibers are going and stimulating the smooth muscles of, yes, arterioles. This is smooth muscle of arteriole. Let us suppose this is representative of smooth muscle of vein, is that right? And some of these sympathetic fibers, okay, they, they have to go to, yes, what is this here? Juxtaglomerular apparatus. Have you heard of it? Which produces renin, right? Juxtaglomerular apparatus is also having sympathetic fibers. Now this is the main biological system, right? Now we will talk about, of course, if you really want to be too good, you can draw here baroreceptor system from aorta and from carotid body, right? And these baroreceptor system are able to stimulate the central sympathetic and parasympathetic outflow. Now what we have to learn? We have to see the different types of antihypertensive drugs how they work on this diagram and bring the blood pressure down. Hypertension is defined as pathologically ele sustained elevated blood pressure. What is hypertension? You have four videos in pathology about hypertension. I will not repeat here, but you know the basic definition of hypertension is if someone has pathologically elevated blood pressure and that elevation in blood pressure is sustained over a long time. Is that right? Now, how the drugs work? We we'll start working from this point. First group of drug I will talk about here. Yes, centrally acting, centrally acting anti-hypertensive drugs. We will see how they work, right? First of all, you have to understand it that there are a group of neurons in this area and when these neurons fire, they stimulate the sympathetic system and that sympathetic system maintains the blood pressure. Is that right? Now, I will bring some neuron from this area to here. For example, there is a neuron which is present in this area. I draw that neuron like this. This is nerve ending and this is the next neuron to be stimulated. Suppose there is a chain of descending neurons which are present in this area. Now normally what happens, listen carefully, normally these neurons are having the vesicles which are loaded with norepinephrine and when these norepinephrine loaded vesicles release norepinephrine, 
this norepinephrine will stimulate the adrenergic receptors on the next neuron and next neuron will be stimulated. Again listen, there are a group of neurons in this area which is called vasomotor center. Now this neuron in the vasomotor center is basically noradrenergic neuron. This neuron releases norepinephrine or noradrenaline which stimulates the next neuron. Is that right? Now, here is a receptor which is called alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. Alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. This is in this synapse, this membrane is presynaptic membrane and this is postsynaptic membrane. Alpha 2 receptors are present on presynaptic membrane. Normally what happens, that norepinephrine which is released by presynaptic membrane, some of this norepinephrine will act on alpha 2 receptor. And when alpha 2 receptors are stimulated, they inhibit the alpha 2 receptors, inhibit the further release of norepinephrine. It means this is an auto inhibitory mechanism. Again listen. These are the neurons present in vasomotor center. Right? We have removed those neurons. How these neurons are working? That one group of neuron is noradrenergic neuron releasing the norepinephrine stimulating the next group of neurons. Is that right? This is how vasomotor center is working. Whatever norepinephrine released, a small amount of that act on presynaptic membrane on alpha 2 receptors and when alpha 2 receptors are stimulated they inhibit the further release of norepinephrine. It means these alpha 2, alpha 2 adrenergic receptors are auto inhibitory mechanisms. What are these? Auto inhibitory. Now listen carefully. If we bring a drug here, let's suppose here the drug here. And this drug is pushing with its, if this drug is stimulating this receptor too much, what will happen? There will be pathological inhibition of norepinephrine release. First imagine that there is a hypothetical drug and this drug is overstimulating auto inhibitory mechanism. So this drug is overstimulating alpha 2 adrenergic receptors and when alpha 2 adrenergic receptors are overstimulated, when alpha 2 adrenergic receptors are overstimulated, then norepinephrine release is inhibited. And vasomotor center will be stimulated or inhibited? That will be inhibited. So centrally acting drugs are working like this cartoon. Centrally acting antihypertensive drugs are alpha 2 adrenergic receptor stimulators. They stimulate the receptor, then stimulated receptor inhibit the further release of norepinephrine. What is the name of the drug? Number one drug like this is clonidine. Clonidine. Have you heard of it? Clonidine. So what is the mechanism of clonidine? From today onward, you will say clonidine is a centrally acting antihypertensive drug which can stimulate alpha 2 adrenergic presynaptic receptors to inhibit the release of norepinephrine from the vasomotor center neurons and vasomotor center gets inhibited. Am I clear? Then there is one more drug which also work like clonidine but it is slightly different. Let me tell you what is that drug. I am going to show you now the second drug. Actually the second drug is very strange. Have you heard of uh, alpha methyl dopa? Alpha methyl dopa. Have you heard of it? Who will tell me how it works? Alpha methyl dopa drug. It is also centrally acting antihypertensive. Let me tell you how it works. First of all, you must know the normal pathway of norepinephrine formation. Okay, I will make a very big now ending to explain the normal pathway of norepinephrine. I am going to enlarge this nerve ending. Is that right? Okay, this is the cell body. This is the nerve ending. What happens normally? Normally the adrenergic nerve endings concentrate tyrosine, you know? They concentrate tyrosine. The adrenergic nerve endings from extracellular environment 
take the tyrosine in, they convert the tyrosine into dopa. They convert tyrosine into dopa. Then dopa into, yes, dopa mean. And then dopa mean is, yes, please. Then what happens? Then dopa mean is, there is special pump here. These are called, this is storage vesicle. And there are special pump in its membrane. And what these pumps are doing? They immediately pump the dopamine into this vesicle. These are called monoamine uptake mechanism. Monoamine mean neurotransmitter with small amine group. Okay. Dopamine will go in. As soon as dopamine is in, okay, I will make now vesicle very big. Now, who has come in? Yes, please. Dopamine. There is another enzyme there. There is an enzyme here. And this enzyme will convert dopamine into nor epinephrine. Is that clear? This is the normal bio biochemical pathway. This is normal biochemistry. We will correlate the biochemistry, pharmacology and pathology here. That biochemically these cells, all those neurons in the body which release nor epinephrine, actually they take the tyrosine convert into dopa, then dopa into dopamine, dopamine into norepinephrine. Is that clear? Of course, there are enzymes here. There is enzyme number one here, which convert the tyrosine into dopa. Then enzyme number two here, which convert dopa into dopamine. And this is enzyme number three, which convert dopamine into norepinephrine. Is it difficult to understand? If you really want to know the name of this enzyme, this is, first enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase. Second is dopa decarboxylase. Is that right? Now listen. Let's come back to drug. What is the name of this drug? What is the name of this drug? Alpha methyl dopa. Now what do we do? This, neuro, this nerve ending normally has, it makes the dopa itself. Normally this nerve ending makes dopa from where? From tyrosine. Now we have given a drug and which takes the place of dopa. But the drug is not dopa, it is alpha methyl dopa. It means the drug is methylated dopa, dopa with methyl group. So what we are doing? We are doing a fraud with the nerve ending. We don't, we provide the nerve ending with a methylated dopa. And these enzymes are fooled, what they do? They take alpha methyl dopa and make convert do, alpha methyl dopa into alpha methyl dopamine. Then they take alpha methyl dopamine into vesicle. And in the vesicle, they convert alpha methyl dopamine into alpha methyl norepinephrine. So, what alpha methyl dopa is doing? What the drug alpha methyl dopa drug when you gave the nerve endings in the central nervous system in the vasomotor center adrenergic nerve endings take up that drug and convert that drug into alpha methyl dopa into alpha methyl dopamine then store and convert that into alpha methyl norepinephrine and then what happens? When action potential come this nerve ending will release norepinephrine or it will release alpha methyl norepinephrine alpha methyl norepinephrine and now listen carefully when this releases Alpha methyl norepinephrine, it is very powerful stimulator of alpha 2, alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. And it's so strongly stimulated, it stops releasing anything else. Right? And where the motor center fails, it goes down. It is inhibited. So now you know there are two drugs which can inhibit the vasomotor center, right? In the medulla, they are called centrally acting sympatholytic drugs because they act in the central nervous system to produce lysis in the sympathetic nervous system. They reduce the activity of sympathetic nervous system. One drug is clonidine, right? This drug directly stimulates alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, pre and alpha-2, pre synaptic alpha-2 receptors. Other is alpha-methyl dopa which get converted into alpha methyl dopamine then into alpha methyl norepinephrine and on action potential when alpha methyl norepinephrine is released this is sort of uh, you can say substituted substitute neurotransmitter and this modified neurotransmitter it is our drug which is there 
Look at the stupid neurons. They are taking up the drug, they are, they are working on the drugs, then they are releasing the drug and release drug inhibit the neuron. Right? Now, this is at molecular level how it works and biochemical level. Let's see what happens at physiological level. What happens to the physiology and pathology of the person? Person was having bl high blood pressure, right? Now, what these drugs will do? When we give clonidine or alpha methyl dopa, vasomotor activity goes up or down? Down. When vasomotor activity is down, central vasomotor center activity is down, sympathetic outflow is more or less? Less. Now it's so easy to understand. Then st sympathetic stimulation to heart is more or less? Heart rate is? If heart rate is less, cardiac output is? Less. Stolic blood pressure is? Less. Right? When sympathetic stimulation to heart is less, contractility of heart is less, stroke volume is less, systolic blood pressure is less, okay. When sympathetic fiber going to the veins, they are overacting, underacting? Underacting. So sympathetic tone to venous system is less. So veins will constrict or dilate. So when veins will dilate, venous return is? Less cardiac filling is less, end diastolic volume is less, stroke volume is cardiac output is less, systolic blood pressure is less. Look at it. Sympathetic tone to arterial system is less. So arterioles are constricted or dilated. So total peripheral resistance is less, and diastolic blood pressure is less. Is that right? And sympathetic supply to the, what is this? Justa glomerular apparatus is less. So renin angiotensin aldosterone system is less. And you know when angiotensin 2 is less, vessels dilate and blood pressure goes down. When aldosterone is less, salt and water is not retained. Again, is that clear? Now, one more thing, now listen carefully. It's not as simple as I told you. Is that right? It's not as simple. Sometimes when we are playing with drugs, we are pharmacologically we are playing with the patient physiology, we control one physiological mechanism, other become irritated. For example, what happened? When in this whole mechanism, during this whole mechanism, you are bringing the blood pressure less, then renal blood flow will be more or less? When renal blood flow is less, then GFR is less, then salt and water retention is more. Body cannot clear the water. So as a side effect, in this, by this mechanism of controlling blood pressure, there is a little retention of salt and water in the body. Right? Anyway, we will not go to the unusual thing. Let's concentrate on the main thing. If now, if I ask you, that how the clonidine reduces blood pressure. Can you tell? First you should tell where clonidine work. Central then you should tell in central nervous system is the answer of an average student. Where clonidine work? In the central nervous system, in the medulla, on the vasomotor center, on the adrenergic nerve endings, on the presynaptic membrane, on the alpha 2 receptor, so that it inhibits norepinephrine release. And this, then you tell, due to that when sympathetic system cooled down, what happens to all the different physiological parameters which are controlling the blood pressure. How the heart rate goes down, how the contractility goes down, how veins dilate, how arteries, arterioles dilate, and how all these factors bring the systolic and diastolic blood pressure down. Any question after this? Okay, I'm impressed by you. As you can understand it. Okay. This was one group of drug. Now let's go to the second group of drug. Thank God, second group of drug is no more used. But just, by the way, I tell you. They have one group of drug which can block the ganglion. These are called ganglion blocker drugs. Of course, if you block the sympathetic ganglion, sympathetic outflow will be reduced. And again, you understand blood pressure will come down. But this group of drug is, drugs, we are not happy. We can say second group of drugs. They are not used now as antihypertensive drugs. They are not commonly used. Why? Because they not only block the sympathetic ganglia, but they also block the 
parasympathetic ganglion and they lead to generalized failure of autonomic nervous system. And they produce, they do reduce the blood pressure, but they also produce many unwanted actions, right? So this second group of drug, which is called ganglion blockers, we are not going to discuss into detail, but you understand their mechanism that they block all the sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglion and by blocking the sympathetic ganglion, they can reduce the sympathetic tone to the heart, to the arteries, to the veins and reduce the blood pressure. But they do many unwanted actions also, we don't use that. Is that do you know any name of a drug which is sympathetic ganglion blocker? Hexamethonium. Have you heard of hexamethonium? Okay, no problem. They are not using it that commonly. Now, the next point where we can interrupt the sympathetic nervous system, listen. To reduce the patient blood pressure down, right now we are working the group of drugs which are sympatholytic drugs, which are reducing the activity of sympathetic nervous system. We have discussed the two groups. Number one, centrally acting sympatholytic drugs, then ganglion blocking sympatholytic drugs. Now you move forward. And you move forward. What should be the next point? Block the sympathetic nerve endings. Don't allow this nerve ending to work properly. If you don't allow the sympathetic nerve ending work properly, can it release norepinephrine properly? So we have pharmacological agents which will disturb this nerve ending. Right? Those drugs as a group are called who will tell me the name? Uh, as, just don't tell me the name of the drug. That may be too much for you. Just tell me the class of the drug. What is that group of drug? First group of drug was central sympatholytic drugs. Second was ganglion blocker. What is the third? Post ganglionic sympathetic nerve ending blockers. Don't find any complicated name. It's very simple. This is post ganglionic sympathetic nerve. This is post-ganglionic sympathetic nerve ending. So what are the drugs? Post-ganglionic sympathetic nerve ending blocker drug. Or some books write simply nerve ending blocker drug. But you have to take care then. Not every nerve ending. Which nerve ending is blocked? Post-ganglionic sympathetic nerve ending is blocked. Now how this nerve ending undergoes dysfunction? There are multiple drugs for that purpose. Is that right? Let me make this nerve ending big here. Okay, I erase this. Now it has gone to. We make a sympathetic peripheral postganglionic sympathetic nerve ending. Suppose this is the nerve ending, right? And this was the fiber from central nervous. Now, you, you, first of all, you must know how this nerve ending works. And of course, here must be smooth muscle. I am showing this relationship, this nerve ending with this smooth muscle, right? And here should be post synaptic, what is this? Receptor on which the norepinephrine will work. Already you know what is taken in, please. Tyrosine, tyrosine converted into dopa. Dopa is concentrated into this vesicle, yes. On the vesicle there is a special type of pump here and which will take the dopa in and when dopa will go in this dopa will convert into dopamine oh my god before taking in it need to be converted into dopamine good and then dopamine is taken in and this dopamine once it is taken in this is converted by one more step into nor epinephrine is that clear anyone has a trouble with this diagram then when action potential come, this vesicle will fuse with the membrane and release what? Nor epinephrine and nor epinephrine will have main action on the post synaptic adrenergic receptors, right? Or we say smooth effector organ. This is the last organ on which nor epinephrine is released. So we call it a factor organ adrenergic receptors. Is that right? Now. What are the different drugs which work over there? One drug is, okay, you know, whatever norepinephrine is released, I told you some of it work as auto inhibitor for alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. Most of it work here. After that, norepinephrine goes where? For example, I, Essence is a very beautiful young lady. 
His sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine, his heart rate goes up. We suppose, right? Heart rate goes up. Do you think it will remain up forever or after some time it should come down? It will come down because he has to see another lady. Now, <laughs> if heart rate is coming down, for example, this was heart, it means norepinephrine actions reduced. Where the norepinephrine has gone? Excellent. This norepinephrine is taken back by the pumps. It is just like that. I throw a ball and pull it back. So adrenergic nerve endings are very clever. They synthesize and release. And whatever they release, 80% norepinephrine, they recapture. They reuptake this norepinephrine. And you know what they do? Then this norepinephrine, they again store. But some of it, if it is left behind, outside, that will be caught by an enzyme. Do you know the name of enzyme? Monoamine oxidase. This enzyme will destroy the norepinephrine. That is why when norepinephrine is taken up, it should be rapidly stored. Otherwise, it will be destroyed by monoamine oxidase enzyme. Do you understand it? There is no problem. Now we have to apply the pharmacology on this basics where the drug is working. We have a drug which is a very naughty drug. The drug uses the same pathway. For example, here is the drug. And the drug is using the same pathway through which norepinephrine is taken up. It, it rides on the same transporter and goes in. And then it rides on another transporter and goes in here. Right? This drug goes in here. When, and drug gets concentrated here. When drug is getting concentrated here, norepinephrine will be pushed out. When norepinephrine will be pushed out, it will be destroyed by monoamine oxidase. So what is happening? We are giving the drug to the patient. Drug through the norepinephrine uptake mechanism enter into nerve ending. And then vesicular, this is storage vesicle. Storage vesicular uptake mechanism, drug goes into norepinephrine storage place. And then it hits, bumps here and there and push out. What? Norepinephrine. And when norepinephrine come out, who is waiting there? Monomine oxidase. In this way, when you keep on giving that drug after some time, you will find the nerve endings are full of drug, not full of norepinephrine. And wonder what happens? When next time you will see a very beautiful young girl, even she comes very near to him, even behave very inappropriately. Action potentials will come. But do you think norepinephrine will come out or drug will come out? Yeah. And will drug work on that? Yeah. No. So what will happen? Heart rate will not go as much high as much it was expected. Sympathetic nerve endings have failed because he is a man with sympathetic nerve endings loaded with the drug, not with the norepinephrine. Do you know the name of that drug which is making the sympathetic nerve ending dysfunctional? What's the name of the drug? Yes, please. I think that young man is really understanding. Yes, what's the name of the drug? No one knows that. Antihypertensive drugs. Everyone should know that. That is called guanadrel. Guanadrel. Have you heard of it ever? Even if you have not heard, but it works. Right? Guanadrel. Guanadrel is a drug. Now we can say what is the mechanism of action of guanadrel? It's taken up by sympathetic nerve endings, concentrate into storage vesicle kick out the norepinephrine, norepinephrine is eventually destroyed by monomine oxidases and these storage vesicles which are loaded with the pseudo drug, you can say pseudo neurotransmitter, we can call it also pseudo neurotransmitter, unfortunately very very active neurons on the arrival of action potential nerve ending releasing pseudo neurotransmitter not the true neurotransmitter. So sympathetic action is lost. This is one way how you make these nerve endings dysfunctional. Is that right? We have made the sympathetic nerve ending dysfunctional. There is another drug which can make the sympathetic nerve ending dysfunctional. Right? I will draw a diagram before I tell the other drug that let's suppose this is adrenergic nerve ending. Rapidly tell me what is coming in? 
tyrosine. This tyrosine acted upon by tyrosine hydroxylase and converted into dopa. And dopa acted by dopa decarboxylase and converted into dopamine. dopamine. And this dopamine is concentrated by special type of uptake mechanism in the vesicle. We call it vesicular uptake mechanism. Dopamine goes in, then another uh, enzyme work and dopamine is converted into norepinephrine, right? And when norepinephrine is released, yes, most, it work on, let's suppose this is heart or whatever organ, it work on that effector organ, some of it may produce auto inhibition, but most of it is taken in by special uptake mechanism and then it is stored back normally. This is physiology and biochemistry of this nerve ending. And then we'll see what pharmacology is doing with this. This goes in. Clear? No problem? You already know guanadryl. What it was doing? It was going from here in, then it was going from here in, then it become guanadryl rich and norepinephrine destroyed by monoamine oxidases which are present on mitochondria. They are attached with mitochondria. No bending has mitochondria. And then gonadryl is released. This is one mechanism of gonadryl drug. Have you heard of a drug called reserpine? Ever heard of the drug reserpine? How the reserpine work? Okay, let me tell you how the reserpine work. Reserpine, look here. Reserpine. Reserpine is a drug. Okay, let me make this drug. What it is doing? What the reserpine is doing? Reserpine is making this pump dysfunctional. It does not allow the storage vesicular pump to work. Reserpine is a drug that it will also go through this pathway, but it will not go in. You know, there's a difference in guanadryl or reserpine. Guanadryl goes inside the neurotransmitter vesicle, but Reserpine simply bind with the membrane of storage vesicle and makes the dopamine uptake transporters dysfunctional. And those transporters don't work at all. If these transporters are not working, do you think dopamine can go in? So what will happen? Dopamine is monoamine. Norepinephrine is also monoamine. So monoamine oxidase will destroy the dopamine. And what will happen? These vesicles will be empty. Once they release their content, when you make the new vesicle and you want to fill it with dopamine and norepinephrine, in the presence of reserpine, can you fill the storage vesicle? No. So you have the storage vesicles, but they are empty. These bags are empty. So we have made a game with the nerve ending. The nerve ending is having the vesicles. And when action potential will come, vesicles will move. But will they release anything? Will there be any action? No. So this is what reserpine does. Now there's difference in guanadryl and reserpine. Guanadryl was displacing the, this guanadryl was entering into vesicles and displacing the norepinephrine and guanadryl itself was released when there was stimulation. Reserpine was more cruel. It simply binds with the pumps on the storage vesicle so that dopamine cannot get in. If dopamine cannot get in, norepinephrine cannot be formed and stored. And dopamine, once it cannot get in, it will be destroyed by the monomine oxidases, right? And reserpine keep on working there. So under the treatment of reserpine, sympathetic noradrenergic nerve ending, I should say noradrenergic nerve endings fail. In the central nervous system as well as in peripheral nervous system. Is that right? And that will reduce the sympathetic activity. Any question up to this? Then another drug which is also playing the game with the nerve ending. Up to now, how many drugs do you know which play with the nerve endings? One is guanadryl, another is reserpine. Remember, reserpine is very dangerous drug. Now they are using it less commonly. You know why? Because the 
when you give rezorpine, blood pressure really comes down beautifully. And after that, many patients commit suicide. You know why? Because it does not allow the nerve, nerve, uh, these storage vesicles to take the dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine. In the central nervous system, rezorpine goes in the central nervous system. It fails the nerve endings which release dopamine. It fails the nerve endings which release norepinephrine. It fails the nerve endings which release serotonin. Because serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine and dopamine, all of them are monoamine. And all the nerve endings which deal with the monoamine, their storage vesicles become dysfunctional in the presence of rezorpine. So in the presence of rezorpine, what really happens that central nervous system monoamines are not working and person develop depression and there is a high risk of suicide. Is that clear? But anyway, now it's clear how the rezorpine work and how guanadryl work and both have slightly different mechanism in the nerve ending. Now we talk about another drug. There is another drug there, okay, this was your guanadryl, right, this was your guanadryl and here was your, what was the name of this drug, rezorpine, you know they work in a different way but both work on the nerve ending, is that right? Then there is another drug and that drug is called What is the name of this drug? Me tyrosine. It also works on the nerve ending. <laughs> Me tyrosine also works on the nerve ending. You know how it works? This drug goes into nerve ending. Here is a drug called tyrosine. What was the enzyme here? Tyrosine, tyrosine hydroxylase. This enzyme converts the tyrosine into dopa. Is that right? Tyrosine hydroxylase convert the tyrosine into dopa, happily doing its function. And me tyrosine, look here, the me tyrosine is coming here. And what it is doing here? It is blocking the tyrosine hydroxylase. Me tyrosine, listen carefully, me tyrosine is structurally, me tyrosine is structurally similar to tyrosine. So this enzyme is fooled. When you give me tyrosine, me tyrosine also goes in that and enzyme get busy with me tyrosine. But what happens? Me tyro, if I am me tyrosine, I will catch the enzyme and never let it do anything. So enzyme is hijacked by drug. Okay, now it is not happy. It is very very sad. What is the name of the enzyme? Tyrosine hydroxylase, even you see it is weeping. Why? Because metyrosine came and it happily interacted with that, but that grabbed it and then mit enzyme cannot work on metyrosine and cannot work on anything else. Right? Enzyme fail. After the enzyme capturing and failure by the metyrosine, do you think this nerve ending can make more norepinephrine? No, nerve ending fail. So we have three drugs right now which lead to sympathetic nerve endings failure. Is that right? I will tell you the mechanism and you will tell me the drug. If I say there is a drug which concentrate in sympathetic nerve endings or adrenergic nerve endings, drug enter into adrenergic nerve endings, then dr drug stores into vesicle, displaces the norepinephrine and destroy and the drug is released in place of norepinephrine. What is the name of the drug? Guanadryl. Okay. Then there is another drug and that drug binds with the storage vesicle transporters and does not allow the storage transporter vesicles to work. So dopamine cannot go in and this dopamine which is desperately trying to go in is captured by monomine oxidase and destroyed and vesicles remain empty. What is the drug? Rezorpine. Okay. There is one more drug and that drug enters into these nerve endings and bind with tyrosine hydroxylases and make that dysfunctional so that biochemical synthetic pathway for norepinephrine is blocked. What is the name of the drug? Metyrosine.
So we were talking about the drugs which fail the sympathetic nerve endings, right? And once these sympathetic nerve endings fail, either by gonadrel or rezerpine or by the metyrosine, then what happens? That there is reduced release of norepinephrine. Now when these nerve endings are, sympathetic nerve endings are not working well, naturally there is reduced norepinephrine going to the veins. So venomotor tone is reduced, veins will constrict or dilate? dilate. When veins will dilate, venous return will be? less ventricular filling will be less, less. and diastolic volume is less. less and stroke volume is less. less what will happen cardiac output less and eventually systolic blood pressure down is that right plus when sympathetic nerve endings fail then arteriomotor tone also goes down and total peripheral resistance become less and when total peripheral resistance becomes less, then naturally diastolic blood pressure becomes down. Thirdly, when sympathetic nerve endings fail, then stimulation to glomerular apparatus become less, renin become less, and conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 become less, and eventually angiotensin 1 being converted into angiotensin 2 also become less. So really what happened? Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system also reduces its activity. Is that right? You know angiotensin 2 is venoconstrictor, so veins dilate. Angiotensin 2 is arteriolo constrictor, so they also relax. And angiotensin 2 stimulates the release of aldosterone. And so aldosterone is less and salt and water retention is less. And venous return will be less because salt and water is less in the body. So blood volume is less. Ventricular filling is less. Again, Stroke volume is less, cardiac output is less, systolic blood pressure is less. Is that clear? And of course, when sympathetic nerve endings are working less, then cardiac stimulation by sympathetic nerve ending is also less. So heart rate is less, contractility is less, cardiac output is less, and blood pressure comes down. This is difficult to understand. Okay. After that, so this was our third group of drug that these drugs are also sympatholytic drugs which lead to failure of sympathetic nerve endings. So up to now we have done three sympatholytic drugs, central sympatholytic drugs, ganglion blocker and sympathetic nerve ending blockers. Any question up to here? There is no question. Now we come to the next group of drugs that are also sympatholytic. You know once norepinephrine is released, this will act on its target organ. And on the target organ, there are sympathetic postsynaptic sympathetic receptors. Let me make it clear that on the heart, when epinephrine is released, what are the receptors here? Adrenergic receptors on which epinephrine work or norepinephrine work? They are beta 1 receptors. So they are beta 1, beta 1 adrenergic receptors on the heart right and on the veins they are mainly alpha 1 adrenergic receptor and in the same way on arteriolar smooth muscle there are mainly alpha 1 adrenergic receptors on most of the arterioles because on the skeletal muscle the arterioles they have dominantly beta 2 adrenergic receptors now we will talk about next group of sympatholytic drugs right we have already discussed one group was Yes, centrally acting sympatholytic drugs. Second was ganglion blocker. Third was sympathetic nerve ending blocker. Now we come to the fourth group of drug. They are sympathetic receptors blocker. You can say adrenergic, adrenergic receptor blocker drugs. They are adrenergic antagonist. Right? Already we have discussed that adrenergic receptors are alpha receptors and beta receptors. And we have discussed alpha 1 receptors, adrenergic receptors are mainly on, yes, veins and arterioles. And beta 1 receptors are mainly on the heart. Is that right? Now, the adrenergic receptor blocker drugs 
सम ऑफ देम आर अल्फा वन ब्लॉकर सम ऑफ देम आर अल्फा वन रिसेप्टर ब्लॉकर लेट सपोज दैट वी यूज अ ड्रग विच इज अल्फा वन एडोनर्जिक रिसेप्टर यस एंटेगोनिस्ट एंटेगोनेस्ट अल्फा वन एडोनर्जिक रिसेप्टर एंटेगोनेस्ट डू यू नो नाउ alpha 1 adrenergic receptors antagonists what they will do they will block here this is mechanism number 4 right that this drug will block the alpha 1 receptors on the veins as well as they will block the alpha 1 receptors on the arterioles now it's so easy to understand if we give alpha 1 blocker drugs then sympathetic activity on the veins is inhibited venous smooth muscle is inhibited veins will dilate venous return will be reduced and if venous return is reduced and as ventricular filling is reduced and end diastolic volume is reduced and stroke volume reduced cardiac output reduced and systolic blood pressure is reduced secondly when alpha 1 receptor blocker drug act on arteriolar smooth muscle and block the alpha 1 receptors then arteriolar smooth muscle also relax so there is arteriolar dilation and when there is arteriolar dilation that will lead to what thing total peripheral resistance the resistance to the blood flow is reduced and diastolic blood pressure comes down so you understand how the alpha 1 receptor blocker work but here i want to highlight one thing that when we concentrate really on the concept of alpha adrenergic receptor antagonist or blockers right there are two groups of these drugs there are non selective non selective blockers and there are yes selective blockers blockers non selective block alpha 1 receptor as well as they block alpha 2 receptors and selective blocker drug block only alpha 1 receptors is that right so it means alpha 1 receptor blockers are two types of drugs some block alpha 1 and alpha 2 both and some drugs only block alpha 1 right we have to see which one are superior drug the drugs which block alpha 1 and alpha 2 both they are called non selective alpha blocker example is phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine phenoxy benzamine and phentolamine and selective which block only alpha 1 receptors they are yes please who will tell me the name of the drugs which are alpha 1 blocker but not blocking the alpha 2 anyone yes alpha 1 blockers selective alpha 1 blocker they don't block alpha 2 right prazosin have you heard of prazosin 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 doxazosin sen prazosin trazosin and doxazosin these are very commonly used drugs but these are not commonly used alpha 1 selective alpha 1 blockers are superior drug for for use in hypertension to bring the blood pressure down phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine do bring the blood pressure down but they are not very good drugs why you no there is some special reason okay let me explain before you tell me something totally new right listen let suppose this is your heart right and here here is your venous system we take the blood to the heart and of course here is your arterial system it's a very simple diagram dangerously simple diagram right now listen carefully this is sympathetic nerve ending to the heart this is sympathetic nerve ending to the vein and suppose here is the sympathetic nerve ending to arteriole let's suppose these are the receptors now this is alpha 1 adrenergic receptors this is alpha 1 receptor here is also which receptor alpha 1 receptor what is the receptor here yes please beta 1 adrenergic receptor now all these nerve endings are releasing norepinephrine they are releasing yes norepinephrine these are sympathetic nerve endings na no? all of them will release norepinephrine 
Arteries and veins have mainly alpha 1 receptors and heart has beta 1 receptor, but all of them have auto inhibitors. What is this? Alpha 2 receptors. There are also alpha 2 receptors. Here are also alpha 2 receptors. Clear? Now listen carefully. If we use, for example, phentolamine or phenoxybenzamine, which block alpha 1 and alpha 2 both, what will happen? Before that, first you understand a very, very basic concept. The basic concept is that whenever you use, you do alpha blockade, you block the alpha 1 receptor, veins will dilate, arterioles will dilate, is it right? And what will happen? That blood pressure will Down. fall, blood pressure will fall. Venous return to the heart will be decreased. Again, listen first of all carefully. First, I tell you the basic. Do you know the mechanism of orthostatic hypotension? Have you heard of the term orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension? Or let me tell you exactly what happened. First, I'm going to talk about physiology, normal physiology. Then I will apply that on the drug use. Let's suppose this is a normal person lying on the bed. He's, he has not taken any drug and this person is absolutely healthy. He is lying on the bed. If you suddenly stand up, gravity will pull the blood down. So there are chances when you stand up from the bed morning, when you suddenly stand up from the bed, chances are there that gra gravity is preventing the venous return to the heart. So blood will pull into veins of the lower part of the body. Blood has a tendency to pull into, to, to accumulate into lower part of the body. But actually what happened, as soon as you stand up, right, blood pulled down, a little pulling, when, then venous returns slightly down, venous returns slightly down, cardiac filling slightly down, cardiac output slightly down, then baroreceptors report to the medulla that blood pressure is down. falling. And medullary vasomotor center fire sympathetic system. And that sympathetic system squeezes the veins in the legs. And that squeezes the veins in the legs so that venous return should be maintained. Are you understanding me? What I'm talking about? This is a normal thing. That on standing, your blood has a tendency to pull into lower part of the body, but thank God sympathetic nervous system fires and constricts the veins and prevents the pooling of the blood and maintains the venous return to the heart. Claro? Right. Now we come to a person who has been given a sympatholytic drug. A person in him in whom sympathetic system is not working well. For example, you have given alpha-1 blocking drug. A person who has been given alpha-1 blocking drug or sympathetic nerve ending blocking drug. Now such person from lying down position, if he suddenly stand up, sympathetic system will fire in the central nervous system. But can norepinephrine act on veins? No, either nerve ending is failing or alpha-1 receptors are blocking. So, do you think veins will constrict or remain dilated? So, blood will pull into lower part of the body. Venous return will become sure very less. Cardiac output will become very less. And cardiac output will be less. And on standing, your systolic blood pressure will dramatically drop. But patient will not come and tell you, doctor, you see my systolic blood pressure is down. No. Patient will come to you, doctor, I don't know, you gave me the drug and when I wake up in the morning or whenever I stand up, I feel vertigo. Because bl blood going to the brain is less, so he feels vertigo. Or he feels blackout. Or sometimes even they fall down, patient due to that. So this is the result of hypotension, which is produced due to sudden change in the posture. When sympathetic nervous system is not working. This type of hypotension is called postural hypotension. Another name for this hypotension is called orthostatic hypotension. Another name for this hypotension is hypostatic hypotension. Is that right? So all those drugs, we don't allow the veins to constrict on standing, produce a side effect of what thing? Postural hypotension. Postural hypotension. Whenever there is postural hypotension, naturally, Normally, listen, 
normally when you stand up sympathetic nervous system fire is that right veins constrict and heart rate also go little up is that clear after understanding this thing now we come to the back to this diagram right let's suppose you have given a person alpha 1 blocker as well as alpha 2 blocker is that right advantage of giving alpha 1 blocker is what you give the alpha 1 blocker veins relax arterioles relax when veins relax venous return become less cardiac output become less systolic blood pressure come down when arterioles relax total peripheral resistance is reduced and diastolic blood pressure come down this is what we wanted we are happy about it but there are few things which are un making us unhappy what is the unhappy thing that once you have given alpha blocker veins cannot respond to the sympathetic overflow on standing or can they respond when you have given alpha 1 blocker do you think when from lying down position you suddenly stand up sympathetic system will fire but do you think veins will constrict no because no in a person with drug no and he will develop orthostatic hypotension this is one problem with alpha blocker right but with alpha 2 blocker there is a very special problem you know what is that when you do use this group of drug you are blocking alpha 1 as well as you are blocking alpha 2 is that right alpha 2 receptor was inhibiting the release of, it was auto inhibitor when alpha 2 receptor is stimulated there is less norepinephrine and if alpha 2 receptor is blocked nerve ending assume that it has not released any norepinephrine so it will release extra now listen very very carefully when alpha 2 receptors are the eyes of the neuron that when neuron releases norepinephrine some norepinephrine work on alpha 2 receptor right and nerve ending can estimate how much norepinephrine it has released if it has released too much then alpha 2 receptors are too much stimulated and it does not release further norepinephrine it is auto control auto inhibition clear now listen if you have given drug phentolamine or phenoxybenzamine alpha 2 receptors are also blocked along with the alpha 1 is that right what will happen to this nerve ending if this receptor is blocked a little norepinephrine which is present here can this norepinephrine stimulate alpha 2 no so this neuron will assume if there is no alpha 2 receptor stimulation it means there is no norepinephrine it will release less or more more, more. now when you give phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine when alpha 2 receptors are also blocked all sympathetic nerve endings start releasing excessive amount of norepinephrine this extra amount of norepinephrine cannot work on veins because their receptors are blocked they cannot work on arteries because their receptors are blocked but when this is blocked and they release torch beta 1 receptors are not blocked beta 1 receptors are not blocked so it means that extra release of norepinephrine due to blockage of alpha 2 receptor drives the heart mad and these patient this severe tachycardia and they say doctor what type of drug you have given we have double problem from lying down when we stand up our heart rate goes up and we develop blackouts and vertigo at the top because norepinephrine our heart is going crazy without seeing any beautiful girl our heart is getting crazy they all the feel all the time they feel what they feel they feel palpitations palpitations are how do you define palpitations when you can feel your heart beat look in romantic literature your definition is right but in medical literature look look in medical and medical literature palpitations are defined as unpleasant awareness of your own cardiac activity unpleasant awareness of your heart activity for example if you do exercise and you feel your heart is boom boom it is good or if you are under some very intimate relationship your heart races up do you think you will go to doctor and you say i want treatment <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but if someone sitting someone sitting and heart is boom boom it is healthy or unhealthy <laughs> it is unhealthy that is palpitation for which you will go to the doctor so what is palpitation palpitation is unpleasant awareness of your heartbeat right so what happened this person 
where alpha 2 receptor is blocked and norepinephrine is released too much by the sympathetic nerve endings, right? Maybe norepinephrine release on veins and arteries is not producing any problem because alpha 1 receptor is blocked, but unfortunately, on the heart, beta 1 receptors are not blocked, so excessive release of norepinephrine due to alpha 1, alpha 2 receptor blockage, excessive release of norepinephrine produces severe tachycardia in the heart and patient develops palpitations. So, this is the problem with phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine because they block not only alpha 1 but they also block the alpha 2 and any drug which block the alpha 2, it increases sympathetic nerve ending activity. But you remember clonidine and alpha methyl dopa, they were actually not blocking alpha 2, they were overstimulating alpha 2. So don't get confused. Centrally acting drugs were overstimulating alpha 2 so that sympathetic nerve endings are inhibited. But here our drug is blocking alpha 2. Is that clear? No problem. So, phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine are not good. But prazosine, trazosine, doxazosine are good. Why? Because they block the alpha 1, but they do not block alpha 2. And if they do not block the alpha 2, what will happen? Their sympathetic nerve ending will not overfire. Then sympathetic nerve ending will not overfire. So, this type of tachycardia will not be produced. Am I clear to everyone? Right? So, if someone asked you how the alpha blockers reduce blood, first of all, if someone asked you that you want to treat the patient with alpha blockers, you will preferably use non-selective alpha blockers or selective alpha blockers? Selective. selective alpha blockers, right? And how the selective alpha blockers work? They block alpha 1. Of course, they block alpha 1 receptors. Then what they do? Then you have to tell that this pharmacological action is changing what type of physiological parameter which is reducing the blood pressure. Physiological parameter is we know dilation will occur, arterial or dilatation will occur. Mechanism you know, alright, blood pressure will go down, alright. After that, let's move ahead. Again, let's recap. Sympatholytic drugs, what were these drugs? Central sympatholytic drugs, right, which were those drugs? Centrally acting sympatholytic drugs were clonidine and alpha methyl dopa. They stimulate alpha 2 receptors in the central noradrenergic nerve endings and inhibit them. And sympathetic outflow reduced. Second group was ganglion blockers, which are not used these days. Then there were nerve ending blockers, if you remember. Nerve endings were blocked by or dysfunctional by three mechanisms. One was reserpine, which blocked the vesicular transporter mechanism. Other was gonadryl, which sits in the vesicles. Right, and third was metyrosine, which blocked the synthesis of block the synthesis of synthetic pathway of dopamine and eventually norepinephrine. Clear? Next was you block the alpha one receptors. Is that right? Now why don't we talk about beta one receptor blockers? Is that right? So next is that next group of antihypertensive drugs are beta blockers. We'll talk about how the beta blockers work. We were talking about as a group adrenergic receptor blocker. There are three types of adrenergic receptors blocker. One was alpha blockers. Yeah, other was, yes, beta blocker. And third was mixed blocker, mixed acting drugs. I will explain that later. Alpha blockers, we have already discussed that there are non-selective and there are selective and non-selective are phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine and selective are trazosine, prazosine and doxazosine. Clear? Now we come to beta blockers. Right? There are many beta, beta blocker drugs. There are non-selective beta blockers and there are, yes please, selective beta blocker. Non-selective beta blocker block beta 1 receptor as well as they block reduce the activity of beta 2 receptor. Selective beta blockers are Yes, mainly acting on beta 1 receptors. Is that right? They block the beta 1 receptors more than the beta 2 receptors. Selective. Of course, typical drugs in this category is, yes, propranolol. And in this category is atenolol. And there are many other drugs also. I will not go into detail. I will just tell how they work. How the beta, mainly antihypertensive action is achieved by beta 1 blockade. Right? 
your benzocupropranolol or atinolol or many other related drugs as antihypertensive drugs, basically when they block the beta-1 receptors, blood pressure goes down. Now we have to see how blood pressure goes down. Number one, beta-1 receptors are present on the heart. Beta-1 receptors are present on the heart. Beta-1 receptors are present on SA node, they are present on AV node. These are the beta-1 receptors. AV node also has beta-1 receptor and myocardium also has beta-1 receptors. Right? Now, when you block the beta-1 receptors, what happens? If SA node beta-1 receptors are blocked, SA node is no more stimulated by sympathetic nervous system. That will lead to reduced heart rate. In the same way, when AV node beta-1 receptors are blocked, the conduction through AV node becomes slow and when conduction through AV node becomes slow, that also reduces heart rate. And when beta-1 receptors are blocked on the ventricular myocardium, then sympathetic system cannot produce excessive stimulation for contractility and contractility reduces. You know, sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate and increases contractility. So by giving beta blockers, you reduce the heart rate and you reduce the contractility. So, when contractility is reduced, there is reduced stroke volume. So, these are the cardiac effect on the, by the beta blocker. So, how the beta blockers work on the heart, they reduce the heart rate, they reduce the stroke volume. Then of course, heart rate and stroke volume is reduced, eventually cardiac output is de decreased and systolic blood pressure will come down. This is one way how beta blockers work that they reduce the heart rate, they reduce the contractility and they reduce the cardiac output, they reduce eventually systolic blood pressure. Moreover, beta 1 receptors are present at one more place in the body. Every good student knows that beta 1 receptors are present on the heart, but some very good student know there is one more place where beta 1 receptors are present. Yeah, juxta glomerular apparatus, very good. So beta 1 receptors are also present on juxta glomerular operators. When you give beta 1 blocking drugs, then sympathetic stimulation to the juxta glomerular operators is also reduced. Are you understanding it? That beta 1 receptors are not only present on the heart, beta 1 receptors are also present on juxta glomerular operators. So this is that when juxta glomerular operators has its beta receptors blocked, when sympathetic nervous system cannot stimulate the juxta glomerular operators, so production of renin will go down. down. Whole renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis will be down. Now, how it will reduce the blood pressure? Very easy. Of course, when whole this system is down, then level of angiotensin 2 in the blood are up or down? Down. 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 Now, angiotensin 2 receptors are present on, what are these? venous smooth muscle and angiotensin 2 receptors are also present on arteriolar smooth muscle. So when angiotensin 2 levels come down then veins dilate, remaining things you must tell, veins dilate, venous return is reduced, ventricular filling is reduced, end diastolic volume is reduced and contractility is, of course, more you stretch more you contract, if you less and uh, ventricle is Underfilled, it will contract less. So, stroke volume is reduced and cardiac output is reduced and systolic blood pressure comes down. At the same time, when angiotensin 2 is less, arterioles dilate because they are no more constricted by angiotensin 2. Right? And when arterioles dilate, total peripheral resistance becomes less. And when total peripheral resistance becomes less, diastolic blood pressure comes down. Is that right? So what we have seen up to now that beta blockers can reduce the blood pressure by their cardiac action and they can also reduce the blood pressure by their action on the juxtaglomerular operators. Right? On juxtaglomerular operators when beta blocker were applied that reduces the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis all activity down. When angiotensin 2 is less, veins dilate, arterioles dilate, of course blood pressure goes down plus angiotensin 2 receptors are also present on adrenal gland cortex. In adrenal gland cortex there is zona 
granulosa. Zona granulosa, they are also angiotensin 2 receptors. And angiotensin 2 is less. Zona granulosa is overstimulated or understimulated? Understimulated. So aldosterone is more or less? Less. If aldosterone is less, you must be knowing that aldosterone help the last part of the nephron to reabsorb salt and water. So when aldosterone is less, nephron cannot reabsorb salt and water and salt and water is lost into his urine. So blood volume become less and venous return become less and diastolic volume less, stroke volume less, cardiac output less and which blood pressure is less? Systolic blood pressure is less, right? Then, these are the two basic pathways how the beta blockers work as antihypertensive. The beta blockers mainly produces antihypertensive actions by cardiac actions and by renin angiotensin aldosterone system action, right? Plus, now they say that beta blockers also reduce the central sympathetic outflow. Do you really want to learn or I move forward? You want to learn it? Okay. You remember there was your friend, there was a neuron here. Right? And this neuron was having a friend here. What was that autoreceptor? Alpha 2 adrenergic receptor. Right? And you were knowing that when norepinephrine is released, some of it auto inhibited. Clear? It was inhibitory signal. And you remember which drugs were stimulating this? Clonidine and alpha methyl dopa. They stimulate it and it become over inhibited. Actually, this nerve ending which is releasing norepinephrine, it has auto inhibitors as well as it has auto stimulator. They believe that it has auto stimulator here and that is beta 1 receptor, adrenergic receptor. If you stimulate alpha 2, this nerve ending get inhibited. And if you stimulate beta 1, nerve ending get excited, excited stimulated. So, if you really want to inhibit this neuron, what you should do? Stimulate this one and block this one. Is that right? So, beta blockers block also here. Auto stimulatory pathway. So, sympathetic outflow will be reduced. Am I really clear? It is just like that as you have a car and you have a biological brakes and biological accelerator. If you really want to stop the car, stimulate the brakes and inhibit the accelerator. So here also biological accelerator is beta 1 receptor and biological brakes are alpha 2. So if you really want to reduce the central sympathetic outflow, you stimulate the alpha 2 which are biological brakes and inhibit the alpha 1 which is biological auto accelerator. Am I clear? Right. So this was how different uh, alpha 1 and beta 1 blocker drugs work as antihypertensive. Yeah? Uh, the non-selective beta blockers also block the beta 2 receptors, right? And beta 2 receptors blocking only produces unwanted action for us. You know why? Because arterioles which are going to the skeletal muscles, they have beta 2 receptors. And normally when epinephrine work on the beta 2 receptor, it produces arteriolo construction. No, dilation. Arteriolo dilation. Let me repeat it. That the arterioles which are going to the skeletal muscle, they are having on smooth muscle of those arterioles beta 2 receptors. And beta 2 receptors are stimulated arterioles dilate. But when alpha 1 receptor on skin, uh, other arterioles are stimulated arterioles constrict. So we can say all the arterioles in the body, either they have alpha 1 receptor or they have beta 2. If on arteriole alpha 1 receptors are there, arterioles will constrict. And if there are beta 2 receptors, arterioles will dilate. Am I clear? Sure? Now. Actually, when you give beta blocker, if they block the beta 2 receptors on skeletal muscle arterioles, then beta 2 mediated arteriole dilatation is lost and arterioles to the muscles will constrict. And do you think person will like exercise or dislike exercise? Dislike. That is why patient on the beta blocker drugs develop intolerance to exercise and they develop easy fatigability. So this factor does not reduce blood pressure, rather it produces side effects. 
That is why I did not talk because I'm not teaching the drug as a whole. I'm just telling you today that how different antihypertensive drugs bring the blood pressure down. Later on, I will tell how a whole lecture on every group of drugs, their side effects and their other interactions. Is it clear? Right, so this was something about the beta blockers. Right, now we move forward to the next group of antihypertensive drugs. Let's just write down how many antihypertensive drug groups we have discussed up to now, just their main groups. First of all, we discussed centrally acting sympatholytic drugs. Centrally acting sympatholytic drugs. Then there were ganglion blockers which are not used. Then there were sympathetic nerve ending blockers. You know your three friends. All right. Then there was, yes, alpha receptor blockers. Then next group was beta blockers. Is that right? Any question up to their mechanism if someone asks how these drugs work, can you tell how they bring the blood pressure down? Sure. Now we go to the next group. These are called directly acting, directly acting vasodilators. First, first of all, I will tell you why they are called directly acting. They have found, listen carefully, some drugs can directly go into veno, venous smooth muscle or they enter into arteriolar smooth muscle. They enter inside and directly relax the smooth muscle. These venodilators or arteriolodilator group of drugs don't work through sympathetic nervous system. Is that right? They directly dilate, the, relax the smooth muscle. But of course, there must be a mechanism. There are drugs in this group, some drugs which are mainly arteriolodilator and some drugs which are arteriolo and venous both direct, veno dilator plus arteriolodilator, right? And some are mainly arteriolodilator, they mainly dilate the arteries. Let me tell you what are the drugs which are mainly arteriolodilator. You must be knowing them. Yes. Hydralazine. Then there is another drug. Yes, there is diazoxide. Have you heard of it? And there is one more drug which directly dilate the arterioles. Yes. There is one more group of uh, one drug which dilate the arterioles, minoxidil. Have you heard of it? Minoxidil. Right, before I go into detail, I forget one group. I have mentioned alpha blocker, beta blockers, then six number should be mixed blocker. You remember? Mixed blocker and seventh should be this one. In mixed blocker, there were drugs like Carvedilol and there are drugs like like Carvedilol. It blocked the alpha 1 as well as beta 1 receptors, right? Carvedilol is a group, right? And this will work on alpha 1 receptor as well as beta 1 receptors. Now, when you give the Carvedilol to person, right? When we will do alpha 1 blocker, it will produce venodilatation and arteriolodilatation. When Carvedilol will produce beta 1 blocker, it will inhibit the heart. You can understand how the blood pressure will go down the combined action of alpha-1 and beta-1 blockers. Are you understanding? I was telling you that alpha-1 blockers are antihypertensive. Then I told you beta-1 blockers are also antihypertensive. Then a drug which block alpha-1 as well as beta-1. The drug is carvedilol. Is that right? Then another drug which also block both of them is labitolol. 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 Right? So, carvedilol and labitolol, they, they by name, they look as if they are beta blockers, but actually they are alpha blocker plus beta blockers. Is that right? Now, if someone asks how presocin, presocin work, alpha 1 blocker, if someone asks how propranolol or retinolol work, what is that? Beta blocker. But if someone asks carvedilol or labitolol work, alpha blocker plus beta blocker. And then you can write a whole story. 
that when alpha 1 is blocked, how we know dilatation occur, arterial load dilatation occur and all the story, right, okay. After that we came to directly acting vasodilator. There are venodilators and arteriolodilator. Arteriolodilators are hydralazine, diazoxide and minoxidil. And arteriol plus venodilator are nitroprusside. Have you heard of it? Nitroprusside. Now we will see how these drugs can directly relax the smooth muscle. Right? Let me draw one smooth muscle here. This is smooth muscle representative of arterial smooth muscle as well as venous smooth muscle, right? First of all, I will tell you the mechanism of action of diazoxide. Anyone has some idea how the diazoxide relaxes the smooth muscle? I will get $10. Anyone who tell me the mechanism how the diazoxide relaxes the venous or arterial smooth muscle, it's a very powerful drug. And in emergency situations, it is used when blood pressure is resistant, blood pressure is very high and resistant and not coming down, we use diazoxide or nitroprusside. So diazoxide is a very powerful antihypertensive agent. It relaxes mainly arterioles. But how? Okay, let me tell you. Actually, the smooth muscles have potassium channels. And diazoxide, Diazoxide stimulate these, diazoxide stimulate these channels. So what will happen? Potassium channels will close or open? Open. So actually, there is a special type of potassium channels. These are called ATP sensitive potassium channels. These channels are very, very sensitive to diazoxide. If you give the patient diazoxide, diaz diazoxide will go into these smooth muscles and stimulate the potassium channels. And normally, and potassium channels will open up. If potassium channels open up too much, now potassium is more in the cell or potassium is normally more outside? Inside. inside. Cells are the bags of potassium, remember. Inside, there's a lot of potassium. Outside, there's less potassium. So as soon as potassium channel open up, right, what really happens, that a lot of potassium moves out. When potassium moves out unduly, it means when you... Uh, put the diazoxide on these smooth muscles, smooth muscles start losing out potassium. So they are losing cations. If they are losing the positive charges or cations, they become too much electronegative. So for example, normally smooth muscle resting membrane potential is minus 60 millivolt. Minus 60 millivolt normally. After the drug, it will lose too much and it will become more negative. Resting membrane potential become maybe minus 80. So what is happening? That when you give diazoxide, diazoxide opens the potassium channel, smooth muscles lose the potassium. When they lose too much potassium, then what really happens that these cells become too much electronegative. When they become too much electronegative, can they become easily stimulated or depolarized? No. We say that smooth muscle become hyperpolarized. The term which is used, diazoxide make the smooth muscles not depolarized, rather hyperpolarized to the negative side. Smooth muscle become, you know, smooth muscles are normally polarized on the negative side. Minus 60, they are normally polarized. After the drug, they become too much negative polarized. So we say hyperpolarized. And when they are hyperpolarized, for example, this was the threshold at which smooth muscles are stimulated. Before the drug, a little stimulation will stimulate the smooth muscle. Now it needs too much stimulation. So chances of stimulation of the smooth muscle are more or less less, so they will contract more or less, if there are less contractions, the so veins will constrict or dilate. Remember, this drugs work only on arteries. I told you this is arterial or dilator. This does accumulate only in arterial smooth muscle. So, nothing happening to vein. Actually, this drug is accumulating in which smooth muscles? <laughs> arterial. So, arterial smooth muscle will constrict or dilate. Dilate. And total peripheral resistance is? And which blood pressure will come down? Diastolic blood pressure will come down. So these drugs mainly work on the diastolic blood pressure. Is that clear? So you know the mechanism of diazoxide. Mechanism of minoxidil. Thank God. It is the same mechanism as diazoxide. The minoxidil also goes inside the cells and stimulate 
potassium channels let the smooth muscle lose potassium become very negative and then they become resistant to stimulation and arterioles dilate is that difficult no now we'll talk about the mechanism of action of hydralazine and nitroprusside i will explain the mechanism of action of nitroprusside but the same is mechanism of action of hydralazine except hydralazine work mainly on arterioles and uh, nitroprusside work on veins and arterioles both is that right so should i explain the mechanism of action of nitroprusside okay suppose here the smooth muscle first you understand how smooth muscle normally contract then i will tell you how nitroprusside disrupts its contraction and relaxes it normally what happens smooth muscle has actin then myosin do you know that right suppose this is the myosin this is the light head of myosin what are these these are li light chains of myosin the myosin light chains and suppose here are the actins now what happens that myosin head interact with the actin and produce contraction everyone knows that now actually in smooth muscle my myosin light chains should get phosphorylated they should get phosphates what they should get phosphate once they get phosphorylated only then only then myosin light chains can interact with actin so it means that to stimulate the smooth muscle contraction we should phosphorylate myosin light chains so that they interact with actin and produce contraction it means there should be some enzyme there should be some enzyme we should phosphorylate the light chains the enzyme this happy enzyme yeah is a kinase and it produces phosphorylation of light chains what is the name of this enzyme please call it light chain kinases is that right this is a very basic mechanism that normally how the smooth muscle contract listen calcium comes in calcium bind with calmodulin you know it calmodulin calcium calmodulin activate light chain kinases and light chain kinases phosphorylate the light chains and smooth muscle contract this is normal physiology now we see the drug what really happens nitroprusside comes in and releases nitric oxide nitroprusside come into this, the smooth muscle and releases nitric oxide or even hydralazine to arterial smooth arteriolar smooth muscle releases nitric oxide it means nitric oxide is present in the structure of these drugs and when these drugs enter into smooth muscle they release nitric oxide this nitric oxide will stimulate yes what this nitric oxide is doing it will stimulate a special type of enzyme which is called guanylyl cyclase so nitric oxide stimulates cytosolic guanylyl cyclase guanylyl cyclase convert more gmp as there is atp there is gtp gtp into cyclic gmp so after these drug intracellular level of cyclic gmp goes cyclic gmp level goes up cyclic gmp will stimulate another kinase uh, and this kinase which is stimulated this kinase which is stimulated by cyclic gmp is called protein kinase g because it is stimulated by gmp protein kinase g will phosphorylate what light chains kinases when light chains kinases are phosphorylated they become angry and they don't work remember most of the proteins when they are phosphorylated their action is increased but there are some proteins in our body when they are phosphorylated their actions decrease it is one of those so protein kinases phosphorylate light chain kinases they become so angry they say we are phosphorylated we will not phosphorylate the light chains when they don't phosphorylate the light chains then there are some enzyme phosphatases they remove the previous phosphates and there is no further phosphorylation of light chains and myosin light chain cannot interact with actins so smooth muscle cannot contract so if it is hydralazine 
then arteriolar smooth muscle will relax total peripheral resistance will go down and diastolic blood pressure will be down but if this drug is nitroprotoproteoside then not only arteriolar but venous smooth muscle will also relax and arteriolar dilatation plus there is venodilation and you know what will happen when veins are dilated we again venous return less then and diastolic volume less stroke volume less cardiac output less systolic blood pressure down and if when arteriolar smooth muscle is relaxed total peripheral resistance is less and then what happens yes diastolic blood pressure goes down so that's all for today we will continue the lecture tomorrow right so now we will continue with the mechanisms of actions of antihypertensive drugs already what we have discussed is number one centrally acting sympatholytic drugs then we discussed about ganglion blockers which are no more used right then we were talking about yes nerve ending uh, sympathetic post ganglionic uh, nerve ending blocker is the right then we were talking about alpha blockers yes and beta blockers is that right and then we were talking about directly acting directly acting vasodilators right did we discuss anything else just see your notes did we discuss anything else we did not right so this is these uh, six groups we talked about that first of all that was centrally acting sympatholytic drugs in which the uh, classical examples were alpha methyl dopa and clonidine right then there were ganglion blockers which are no more used like hexamethonium then there were nerve endings blocker like reserpine which leave the vesicles empty or you can use guanadrel which can fill the uh, vesicle with their own self right then we talked about uh, you can say alpha blockers like prazosin and trazosines and beta blockers like propranolol and atenolol did we discuss beta blockers and the mechanism of action that how they really reduce the blood pressure did we talked about that they reduce the heart rate and then that and reduce the contractility okay then after that we talked about directly acting vasodilators like nitroprusides and directly acting arteriolar dilators uh, which were like hydralazine and minoxidil we talked about their mechanism of action that's good now we will talk about the next group of the drugs right and next group of drug which are very important antihypertensive drugs that is calcium channel blockers right let me explain how the calcium channel blockers work you must be knowing that calcium influx is required for the contractility of the heart you know myocardial cells myocardial cells are special calcium channels and voltage gated calcium channels allow the calcium to go in and this calcium triggers inside the myocardial cell to release of stored calcium which and that calcium eventually leads to actin myosin interaction and myocardial contractility right so there are drugs which can block the calcium channel calcium channels in the heart as well as these drugs can also block the calcium channels in the arterial smooth muscle because contraction of arterial smooth muscle is also dependent on calcium influx these calcium channels which are specially blocked by calcium channel blockers these are called l type calcium channel l type calcium channels right so these l type calcium channels are blocked by the calcium channel blockers now how the calcium channel blockers really reduce the blood pressure right we'll discuss about that now we have already discussed that calcium channel can uh, blockers can block the calcium channels in the myocardium as well as they can block the calcium channels in the smooth muscles of arterioles right of course when calcium channels in smooth muscles of arterioles are blocked then calcium influx in the smooth muscle is reduced and then of course smooth muscles of the arterioles contract poorly so when smooth muscles of arteriole are unable to contract well or in other words we say that smooth muscle after the application of the calcium channel blockers at smooth muscles of arterioles don't get enough calcium so they don't contract well or in other words we can say they are relaxed 
on smooth muscles of arteriole that relax you can understand that total peripheral resistance for movement of the blood from arterial side to the venous side is reduced so calcium channel blockers we can say number one what they are doing they are uh, reducing the calcium influx in yes influx in arterial smooth muscle and that will lead to reduced total peripheral resistance i think remaining story you know when there is reduced total peripheral resistance you know diastolic blood pressure depend on mainly on total peripheral resistance so that will eventually lead to reduced diastolic blood pressure is that clear secondly calcium channel blockers also block the calcium channels on the myocardium ventricular myocardium especially when those calcium channels are blocked then naturally calcium influx in myocardial cells is reduced and eventually that lead to reduced contractility of myocardium and when myocardial contractility is reduced it's very easy to understand then stroke volume will be reduced so what we can say the second wing which is working is that there is yes reduced calcium influx in myocardium myocardium and reduced calcium influx in myocardium lead to reduced stroke volume which will eventually lead to reduced cardiac output and that will eventually lead to reduced systolic blood pressure is it clear really clear right so these are the two main mechanism how calcium channel blockers work but one point which is very important that you have to understand and remember that some of the calcium channel blockers mainly work on the arterial smooth muscles and the other calcium channels which mainly work on the myocardial cells and still there are other calcium channel blockers which block the both sides let me tell you a classical uh, situation like this let's suppose here we put the heart and here we put your circulation uh, now this is a calcium channel in the myocardium and this is a calcium channel let's suppose on the arterial side is that right now there are some drugs which block the both sides equally right classical example is deltaiazem deltaiazem this type of drug can block the smooth muscle calcium channels and myocard smooth muscle calcium channels and myocardial calcium channels with equal degree but then there are other calcium channel blockers for example nifedipine have you heard of it nifedipine nifedipine mainly blocks arterial smooth muscle and it blocks very little on myocardial smooth muscle uh, myocardial cells right then there is another like vrapamil 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 has less action on blockage of smooth muscle but more action on blockage of calcium channels of heart is that right or if we really make a simpler diagram we can make it like this i think let me make a more simple presentation right here is your heart and here is your circulatory smooth muscle right here i write the name of the drug uh, number 1 okay first of all we write verapamil right verapamil has more action on the heart and less action on arterial smooth muscle then we come to the second drug and second drug is deltaiazem right it has almost same action on both areas right and then there is nifedipine nifedipine has less action on the myocardium but far more action in the arterial smooth muscle that is why when nifedipine is given it lead to relaxation of coronary arterioles and other arterioles in the body as well that is why nifedipine is very very effective not only reducing the uh, blood pressure due to arterial constriction but it also is a very useful drug due to coronary vasospastic disease like prince metal angina in which there is a tendency for coronary vessels to undergo spasticity right and nifedipine can keep the arterial dilatation including the coronary arterial system as well is that right so now with this balance we can see that vrapamil will reduce the blood pressure but mainly by reducing 
reducing the cardiac output so it reduces more systolic blood pressure but when you look at this nifedipine it mainly relaxes the arteriolar smooth muscle so it mainly reduces the total peripheral resistance so it mainly reduces the diastolic blood pressure am i really clear that so, uh, now one thing is very important that if you are giving calcium channel blockers and if you don't want to produce negative inotropic action and negative chronotropic action then you will use this drug is that right because this is a calcium channel blocker with minimum action on the heart am i clear no problem up to this okay so this these are a few words about the mechanism of action of calcium channel blockers as anti hypertensives now we will go to the next drug group we have talked about as seventh group yeah, seventh group was calcium channel blockers now we go to the eighth group eighth group is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors very very important anti hypertensive drugs angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors now onward i will be calling this uh, group of drug ace inhibitors is that right now to understand really how the ace inhibitors reduce blood pressure you should have a clear concept about renin angiotensin aldosterone system as well as you must know how these drugs work let me tell you very briefly that renin is an enzyme which is produced by the kidney a uh, specialized area of the kidney which is called juxtaglomerular operators juxtaglomerular operators is uh, a histological area which is present between the afferent and efferent arteriole and the beginning of distal convoluted tubule right it is made by its smooth muscles of uh, afferent and efferent arterioles and by the uh, nephron cells epithelial cells of the distal part of distal convoluted tubule this area of the distal convoluted tubule this is called macula densa and these smooth muscles which are arterial smooth muscles they are making a blood pressure measuring device is that right and whenever your blood pressure is down right then this uh, whole operators which is called juxtaglomerular operators it re releases an enzyme and that enzyme is called yes please what is the name of that enzyme that is called renin so renin is the name of the enzyme which is produced by juxtaglomerular operators normally i will discuss it very briefly and renin act on another substance which is coming from the liver normally and liver cells are normally producing a substance called angiotensinogen what is this substance which is coming from the liver angiotensinogen renin can work on the angiotensinogen renin can work on the angiotensinogen and angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin 1 this angiotensin 1 through the right heart will go to the pulmonary circulation in the pulmonary circulation and pulmonary endothelial cells you know capillary cells they are having a special type of enzyme and this enzyme is called this enzyme is called angiotensin converting enzyme what is the name of this enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme which is specially expressed on the endothelial cells of pulmonary vasculature is that right so what really happens that just glomerular operators is releasing renin renin will convert angiotensinogen coming from the liver right angiotensinogen is a inactive enzyme protein which is produced by the liver and that is converted by the action of renin into angiotensin 1 it is converted into yes please angiotensin 1 this angiotensin 1 when it passes through the pulmonary circulation right this angiotensin 1 what is this angiotensin 1 it is acted upon by angiotensin converting enzyme and it convert into angiotensin 2 this is very very powerful substance angiotensin 2 and you must know the actions of normal physiological actions of angiotensin 2 there are few actions which everyone knows that angiotensin 2 okay i will write it here actions of angiotensin 2 number 1 it is a very strong normally it is a very strong arteriolo constrictor arteriolo constrictor number 2 it is a very strong veno constrictor 
Angiotensin 2 receptors are present on smooth muscles of arteriole as well as angiotensin 2 receptors are, this is angiotensin 2 receptors, they are also present on smooth muscles of veins. Is that right? So, angiotensin 2 receptors are present on arterioles as well as smooth muscles of the vein. So, what really happens that angiotensin 2 is capable of arterioloconstriction constriction as well as it is capable of veno construction. Plus, angiotensin 2 receptors are present on zona glomerulosa of adrenal cortex. So, angiotensin 2 receptors are also present over here. When angiotensin work on the zona glomerulosa, that lead to release of, yes, that lead to release of aldosterone. It means that angiotensin 2 through arteriolo constriction can increase total peripheral resistance. Angiotensin 2 by the mechanism of venoconstriction can increase the venous return to the heart and increase you can send diastolic volume, stroke volume and cardiac output and angiotensin 2 by releasing the aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, it can force the renal cell to retain more salt and water because aldosterone work on the principal cells of the kidney nephrons and aldosterone while acting on these cells retains salt and water and that salt and water which is retained in the body that is naturally adding to the blood volume and then leading to increased venous return and increased cardiac output and increased blood pressure. Is that right? These are the simple three things which almost every doctor knows but there are some other actions of angiotensin 2 number which are usually overlooked. Number one angiotensin 2 can act on hypothalamus and it increases thirst. Number 2, angiotensin 2 has receptors on vasomotor centers and it can increase sympathetic outflow. Number 3, angiotensin 2 has receptors on adrenergic nerve ending, the angiotensin 2 receptors and when angiotensin 2 stimulate these receptors, they release more norepinephrine. So, it means that angiotensin 2 is also stimulant to, yes please, stimulant to sympathetic, yes, sympathetic nerve endings. Is that right? And then you should not forget as good doctors that angiotensin 2 can act on the heart and it can also lead to pathological if, uh, modification of the heart or we say that it, it produces remodeling of the heart which is a pathological process right if angiotensin 2 levels are chronically high and aldosterone levels are chronically high both of them can act on the heart and produce unfavorable changes in the heart and if angiotensin 2 and aldosterone are very high for very long time they may lead to such changes in the heart that its pumping action is poor and it predisposes the heart for congestive cardiac failure am i really clear right but you can if you remember these three still it's okay you will be an average doctor but if you remember all of them you will be listed in the excellent ones right anyway now we have to see that how angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs work right how these drugs work you must have heard of these drugs like captopril enalapril right lisinopril there are so many drugs in this group now let me tell you exactly how do they work very simple angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors basically these drugs block this enzyme right now let me tell you the main actions of this enzyme yeah this is angiotensin converting enzyme is that right how it works number one it has it has the capability of converting angiotensin yes one into angiotensin two this is one function of this enzyme right it means uh, okay, and there is one more function of this enzyme, who will tell me? Only very good doctors know, there is another function of this enzyme. Everyone knows that angiotensin converting enzyme will convert the angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, but there are some good doctors which also know it is doing one more function. Normally, this enzyme is also leading to breakdown of bradykinin, oh great, so you remember it, bradykinin, so it leads to breakdown of bradykinin. Is that right? So, normally what this enzyme is doing? Listen, bradykinin is a vasodilator. 
So this enzyme by destroying the bradi bradykinin, reducing the vasodilator's level in the blood and by converting angiotensin 1 into 2 increases the vasoconstrictor level in the blood. In this way, angiotensin converting enzyme by reducing the vasodilators and increasing the vasoconstrictor in the blood, it produces intense vasoconstriction. Am I really clear? Now, when you give a drug, right, this is, what is the name of this drug? Of course, this enzyme is now weeping, right. This drug is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, is that right? Now, this drug which is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, right, which uh, inhibits this uh, enzyme, what will be the result? Number one, angiotensin 1 cannot be converted into angiotensin 2, so level of angiotensin 2 go up or down? Down, number one. Number two, do you think bradykinin will be destroyed? No. So, level of bradykinin will go up, is that right? So, in this way, uh, basically, captopril, enalapril or similar drugs, they, by blocking the angiotensin converting enzyme, they basically increase the in, uh, bradykinin level in the blood which produce arterial load dilatation and veno dilatation and reduce the blood pressure. Secondly, they reduce the angiotensin 2 levels in the blood. Now, remaining story is easy to understand. When angiotensin 2 levels in the blood are less, then of course, arteriolo-constriction cannot be maintained. So, there is arteriolo dilation and when arterial dilatation is there, total peripheral resistance is less and when total peripheral resistance is less, diastolic blood pressure will come down, number one. Number two, angiotensin 2 levels when they are less, then venoconstriction cannot be maintained and due to venodilation, uh, venous, uh, venous blood is maintained in, in the venous system and venous return to heart is reduced naturally and diastolic volume is reduced and stroke volume is reduced and cardiac output is reduced and diastolic, uh, oh, systolic blood pressure is reduced. And of course, when angiotensin 2 levels are down, what really happens? Aldosterone levels are also down. When aldosterone levels are down because they are not being released, uh, then naturally principal cell cannot retain salt and water. So, salt and water is lost into urine. So, blood volumes again goes down, venous return goes down, is that true? And diastolic volume goes down. Yes, and stroke volume is less, cardiac output is less and result will be, there will be less systolic blood pressure, right. So, this is what you really, you should know that angiotensin converting enzymes uh, inhibitors by reducing the level of angiotensin 2 lead to arterial load dilatation, veno dilatation and reduced level of aldosterone, right. Plus, you really you are too good, angiotensin 2 levels when they are low, the sympath central sympathetic outflow is also reduced plus uh, there is less stimulation to sympathetic nerve endings and when uh, there is less stimulation to sympathetic nerve endings, naturally the sympathetic system derived cardio stimulation is less, sympathetic system derived arterial constriction is less, sympathetic system derived veno constriction is less and all of that contribute in reducing blood pressure, is that right? And in the same way, angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors are so wonderful drug, not only they reduce the angiotensin 2 level in the blood, but they also reduce the aldosterone level in the blood. When angiotensin 2 and aldosterone levels are less in the blood, then yes, unfavorable cardiac remodeling process is reduced, is that right? So, progression towards the heart failure is reduced. You know that patient who are hypertensive, they have a tendency to go into heart failure. So, pathological remodeling process is reduced in the heart which normally occur with elevated level of angiotensin 2 and elevated level of aldosterone. Now, uh, we were talking about that uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibiting drug are very good in controlling the hypertension specially related with which is leading to congestive cardiac failure. Plus, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs are very very successful in using the, in the patient uh, who are having diabetic nephropathy or hypertensive nephropathy. Let me tell you why these are so wonderful drugs in controlling diabetic nephropathy. Let's suppose here's a kidney and I draw here one representative nephron, but of course every kidney has about one million nephrons. Here is afferent arteriole and this is, what is this? 
glomerular capillaries and this is efferent arteriole which break down into peritubular capillaries. Now, this is the afferent arteriole, right? And here it is efferent arteriole. The point which you have to remember is that smooth muscles of efferent arteriole are very, very rich in angiotensin 2 receptors. Smooth muscles of efferent arteriole are very, very rich in angiotensin 2 receptors. Now, now, in patient with diabetic nephropathy, right, what really happens that uh, afferent arteriole and efferent arterioles due to pathological process start constricting. And in diabetic uh, nephropathy, when efferent arterioles constrict too much, they, they produce very high pressure in glomeruli. Is that right? Again, if efferent arterioles constrict too much, if efferent arterioles are constricting too much due to diabetic nephropathic process, right, then blood is coming to glomeruli, but it cannot go easily forward. So, pressure in glomerular system, glomerular capillaries become very high. And that high pressure in the glomerular capillaries, or in other way, we can say that there is glomerular hypertension. This glomerular hypertension injures the filtration barrier and produces protein urea and eventually severe damage to glomerular structure. Is that right? So, what we really do, if we give these patients angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors, then angiotensin 2 levels in their blood will go down. When angiotensin 2 level will be reduced in the blood, then naturally low angiotensin 2 will not be able to constrict the efferent arteriole strongly. So, constriction of efferent arteriole will be relieved and when there is reduced constriction of efferent arteriole, then blood can move forward easily and glomerular hypertension is relieved and further progressive damage to glomeruli is reduced. That is why angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors uh, drug are considered a nephroprotective in patient with diabetic nephropathy. Am I really clear? No need to repeat it. Right? In simple word what we will say? That when you give captopril or enalapril, angiotensin 2 levels are down. Then angiotensin 2 mediated efferent arteriolo construction is not maintained, dilation of, vasodilation of efferent arteriole reduces the glomerular hypertension and there is less damage to the glomerular structure due to diabetic pathological process. Is it clear? Right. So, this was mechanism of action of angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors as antihypertensive agents. The next group of antihypertensive drugs are, yes, what is the next group? Uh, next group is angiotensin, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, receptor blockers, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Angiotensin 2 receptor blockers are not blocking this enzyme, rather they allow the angiotensin 1 to be converted into angiotensin 2, but angiotensin receptor blocker block the angiotensin 2 receptors on arteriolar smooth muscle, they block the angiotensin 2 receptors in venous smooth muscle, they block the angiotensin 2 receptors on adrenal cortex zona glomerulosa and they also block the angiotensin 2 receptors at sympathetic nerve endings. So, basically they neutralize the action of angiotensin 2 on the target tissue, right? It's easy to understand again how it will bring the blood pressure down that when receptors on arteriole are blocked, arteriolo construction cannot be maintained, angiotensin 2 mediated arteriolo construction cannot be maintained, arteriolo dilatation reduces the blood pressure. Then when angiotensin 2 receptors on the venous smooth muscle are blocked, veno construction due to angiotensin 2 cannot be maintained and resultant venodilation also contribute in reduction in blood pressure. Then of course, when angiotensin 2 receptors are blocked on adrenal cortex, zona glomerulosa, then angiotensin 2 mediated release of aldosterone is reduced and salt and water cannot be reabsorbed and the, uh, uh, there is increased loss of salt and water into urine and that also reduces blood pressure. And of course, it is very easy to understand that when angiotensin 2 receptors on sympathetic nerve endings are blocked, then angiotensin 2 mediated stimulation to sympathetic nerve ending is reduced and sympathetic activity on the heart and venous uh, smooth muscle and arteriolar smooth muscle is reduced and all that reduces blood pressure. Here I think uh, one very important point I would love to mention 
that even though both of them are good drugs, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors as well as angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. The drugs in this group are like losartan. Have you heard of losartan? Right? Losartan. Or the other drug in this group are arbisartan, right? Wellsartan. There are so many sartans there, right? The thing which you have to remember that when you block this enzyme, bradykinin levels goes up. Of course, bradykinin level if goes up, that is good because it relaxes the arterio arteriolar smooth muscle. But bradykinin level in the lungs also become up, and that produces cough. So increase level of again when you use captopril or enalapril, like angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs, then increase level of bradykinin in the lungs and other tissues can produce complications. One complication is that high level of uh, bradykinin in the lungs irritate the cuff, uh, it irritates some certain nerve endings which initiate cuff reflex. So patient develop dry cuff and sometimes it's very very irritable to the patient. This is one of the side effect of uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs. Secondly, in some patient bradykinin levels may go dangerously up and may precipitate angioedema, right, severe edema and mucosal and skin area and sometimes this angioedema is on the vocal cords and which may threaten the life, is that right? So when you feel there's a, someone has a risk of angioedema or you feel that someone in the captopril coughing too much, right, you can sw stop those angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs and you can switch them to, to angiotensin to receptor blocker so that uh, you will get almost all the advantages of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors but you will not get two side effects which are cough and the risk of angioedema that is less right but one thing is very important both of them have a very serious problem both of them are fetotoxic both of them are teratogenic right so angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin uh, to receptor blocker both of these drugs should not be given to of course, pregnant women, pregnancy is usually in women, isn't it? So the both of them should not be given to pregnant females. Clear? Now we go to the next group of drug as diuretics. The last group which I'm going to discuss should be ideally the number one group because in the mechanism of action maybe that is being discussed here as a last group, but when we come to the clinical practice, that is the first line drug for the management of mild to moderate hypertension. The group of the drug are diuretics, right? Their mechanism of action is very simple. Usually two types of diuretics are used as antihypertensive, uh, most commonly thiazides and sometimes we use loop diuretics like furosemide, right? Uh, thiazide and furosemide, both of them what they really do is that they act on the nephron and they reduce salt and water especially sodium and chloride reabsorption. I will discuss the mechanism of action in detail in the lectures related with the diuretics, right? So what really happens that diuretics reduce the salt and water reabsorption, right? And when there's more salt and water lost into urine, is that right? Blood volume is reduced and that will lead to reduced venous return and reduced cardiac filling, reduced and diastolic volume reduced, yes? stroke volume, reduced cardiac output and reduced systolic blood pressure. Uh, this is the antihypertensive action of diuretics initially. But in the long run, diuretic maintain the low blood pressure by producing vasodilatation. This is more important. Initially diuretic produce the, uh, bring the blood pressure down by reducing the blood volume, by, uh, by reducing the salt and water in the body. But in the long run, diuretics reduce blood pressure or keep the blood pressure reduced by producing vasodilation. So you have to remember it, diuretics are not only diuretic and natri diuretic, but they are also vasodilators in low to moderate doses when they are used for long time. Is that right? Of course, vasodilatation will bring the blood pressure down. It's very easy to understand by reducing total peripheral resistance. Is that right? Any question up to this? So this was all about the mechanism of action of different antihypertensive drugs. Now we will talk about a very important concept related with the use of antihypertensive drugs. 
you know when sometimes when you, we are using a particular group of anti hypertensive drugs right for example hydralazine which is a very strong arterial load dilator right now what really happens that one particular type of anti hypertensive drugs is trying to bring the blood pressure down by affecting a special type of a specific type of physiological parameter is that right like hydralazine will try to bring the blood pressure down by arterial constriction then some other compensatory mechanisms of uh, biological systems are activated to elevate the blood pressure again what is happening if you give me one specific type of anti hypertensive drug that drug is trying to trying to bring my blood pressure down but sometimes there are other compensatory mechanism activated which try to elevate the blood pressure or counter the effect of anti hypertensive drug let me tell you how it happens <coughs> let's suppose here is your heart and this is your circulatory system is it right now there are two mechanisms let me explain first the first mechanism let's suppose you have given a very powerful arterial dilator we are using the drug hydralazine and that is bringing the producing arterial dilatation and that is reducing total peripheral resistance total peripheral resistance is reduced whenever total peripheral resistance is reduced and diastolic blood pressure start coming down then baroreceptors right then baroreceptors in aortic arch and baroreceptors in carotid sinus they are stimulated and they actually right what they do they lead to stimulation of sympathetic centers in where medulla right really what happened when your blood pressure is going down right there is less stretch on the aortic arch baroreceptors and carotid sinus baroreceptors and what really happens is blood pressure is going down there is less stretch on these baroreceptors right uh, carotid sinus baroreceptors are innervated by the ninth cranial nerve glossopharyngeal nerve and aortic arch baroreceptors are innervated by 10th cranial nerve that is vagus nerve now glossopharyngeal nerve and vagus nerve afferent fibers sensory fibers take the information to central nervous system report the blood pressure is going down and that will stimulate the vasomotor centers in medulla and these vasomotor centers will eventually lead to what thing sympathetic outflow and this sympathetic outflow right will do what thing stimulate the heart plus it will try to produce arterial constriction but if our drug is arterial dilator direct arterial dilator of course sympathetic system will not be able to produce effective arterial constriction in the presence of the drug but sympathetic overflow will stimulate the beta 1 receptors on the sa node and av node on the heart and that will produce reflex tachycardia what is the term reflex tachycardia so it's so simple to understand that reduced total peripheral resistance increased sympathetic yes out flow and that translate into what thing that leads to reflex tachycardia and of course when reflex tachycardia will occur heart rate will go up cardiac output will go up and blood pressure will naturally go up so in this way uh, hydralazine was trying to re uh, reduce the blood pressure by altering the total peripheral resistance but biological system due to reflex tachycardia will try to increase the blood pressure by increasing cardiac output under these circumstances a very wonderful combination could be beta blockers that with the hydralazine if you give the beta blockers and beta 1 receptors are blocked here that will, will be so wonderful that you will achieve very good anti hypertensive action in this combination am i really clear another thing is that when suppose you are using hydralazine or any other drug which is effectively reducing the blood pressure the effective reduction in blood pressure will reduce of course renal blood flow am i right for example hydralazine is given again we take the same example hydralazine when produces massive vasodilatation a significant vasodilatation then naturally uh, renal blood flow is reduced and that will trigger 
reduce renal perfusion will trigger the release of renin and the renin will activate renin angiotensin aldosterone excess right of course in increase angiotensin 2 will constrict the vessels but that will not be very successful because our drug is directly dilating the vessels but this aldosterone right aldosterone which is released that will retain salt and water in the body and that salt and water which is retained will again increase cardiac output and counter the effects of antihypertensive drug so what we can say that hydralazine has initiated or activated two compensatory mechanisms in the body number one mechanism was decreasing the blood pressure activated the reflex tachycardia number two mechanism decreasing the blood pressure reduced the renal blood flow and that activated renin angiotensin aldosterone excess which again try to take the blood pressure up so it means with the hydralazine if you give diuretics that will also make a lot of sense because with hydralazine when you give the diuretic of course aldosterone will try to retain the salt and water but diuretic will flush out the salt and water and this compensatory mechanisms will be cancelled right so many times we make the combination of the antihypertensive drugs uh, for multiple purposes one purpose of combination is that maybe if blood pressure is very high and if you give only one group of drug you have to give in high dose and that may produce more side effects but if you give combination right then both type of the drugs given in combination two or three they have to be given in low doses so maybe their total side effects are less am i clear secondly the advantages of combination is that when one drug is given they that single drug which try to reduce the blood pressure by one specific type of alteration of one specific type of physiological parameter may activate may activate other compensatory mechanisms right like reflex tachycardia or by salt and water retention and that may again increase the blood pressure these compensatory mechanisms may elevate the blood pressure and antihypertensive drugs efficacy is reduced or its total advantages reduced am i clear now let's talk about antihypertensive drugs as groups <coughs> let's start talking about that how we use the antihypertensive drugs there is something very interesting to know that certain group of patients one group of patient may be treated better by one group of drug and another group of patient may be treated better by some other group of drug for example the classical example is that elderly people respond well to diuretic drugs black people with hypertension respond well to diuretics and beta blocker oh, sorry black people respond well to diuretics and calcium channel blockers young people and white people specially respond well to beta blockers and as a doctor you are supposed to know it if you find a very young girl coming to you white girl very anxious beta blocker and she has hypertension beta blockers are wonderful that not only they will reduce the anxiety uh, rather they are more effective in younger patients also but when a black uh, freakin come right black man comes right statistics has told us diuretics are wonderful calcium channel blockers are wonderful again angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors they are very wonderful again in white and young people right let me write it down there first of all when a patient comes with hypertension to you with mild to moderate hypertension you must know which are the first line drug first line drugs are those drugs which are, can be used safely for a long time and mostly they have less side effects and they are well tolerated drugs what do you think which is the number one drug diuretics yes diuretics are considered especially thiazide diuretics they are considered number one drug as antihypertensive drugs and with that other uh, in the number one group is yes what is that beta blockers right but actually preferably anyone who come with hypertension preferably if there is no compelling compelling reason to use some other group of drug 
we should start with diuretics. Is that right? What I told you that special thing about the diuretic is that they are very effective in elderly patients and diuretics are very very effective in black people, right? And diuretics are relatively inexpensive drugs, they have less side effects, they are taken orally, right? And they maintain the blood pressure at lower level for a long time, indefinitely, as long as you take them, especially thiazide diuretics. Again, for elderly, for elderly patients, elderly is, you must know the three groups. Number one is diuretic. Number two is, yes. Number one is diuretic. Number two is ACE inhibitors and calcium channel block calcium channel blockers and is inhibitors right an elderly patient you can use these drugs again how you really decide preferably you will start with diuretic but if an elderly patient come with diabetes you will love to use angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or if an elderly patient come with angina you will use calcium channel blocker. Are you understanding? So in this way, you have to look at the whole patient. That not only you have to treat the hypertension, there may be some other co-existing co co diseases which have to be treated well. Right? But to remember that elderly patient do not tolerate well alpha blockers. They are not very, very, you can say very well tolerated by the elderly people and beta blockers are also not usually tolerated well by the elderly people. Is that clear? This is one group. If you talk about black people with hypertension and hypertension is very common in black people. Diuretics are wonderful and the other drug is calcium channel blockers. They are wonderful there. If you talk, talk about young and white people, young and white people, right? Uh, two drugs which are most wonderful are beta blockers, yes, and and angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors. Is that right? But when we talk about the first line of action. We keep in our mind diuretics and beta blocker. If there is no compelling reason to use any other group, you should start with diuretic. But if diuretics are either contraindicated or they are not tolerated well, then you must go to the beta blockers. Is that right? So usually what the doctors do that when patient come first time with hypertension when he is diagnosed, if you have started with the diuretics and blood pressure is not well controlled, but patient is tolerating the diuretic. But alone with diuretic, blood pressure is not well controlled, the doctor will add beta blocker. And if patient comes first time and you have started the patient on beta blockers and blood pressure is not well controlled, you will add diuretics. Is that clear? Any problem up to this? Right? Now, few words about the diuretics. Again, uh, I will not discuss the diuretics in detail right now because uh, there is a, I have given already a lecture in the renal pharmacology and there you will discuss the mechanism of action of diuretics, thiazides and loop diuretics in detail. I will just give few comments about the diuretics as antihypertensives. Number one, the diuretics are first line of the drug, right? Number two, the most commonly used antihypertensive drugs because they can be used in low doses, they, they are very inexpensive and they are well tolerated. Right? And usually they are considered uh, superior to beta blockers, especially for the elderly. Again, diuretic reduce the blood pressure initially by reducing blood volume, by producing some degree of diuresis and natriuresis. But it's very important to remember the diuretic maintain the low blood pressure in the long run by vasodilatory reactions. Is that right? Another important point about the diuretics is the diuretics or thiazides, they keep the blood pressure low in spine position as well as in standing posture. 
So both postures and spine posture and standing postures, uh, thiazides can keep the blood pressure low. Another important thing is that diuretics usually do not produce significant postural hypotension. You have the concept of postural hypotension? Postural hypotension means that when a person is lying down and if suddenly stand up and there is a significant drop in systolic blood pressure. If there is significant drop in systolic blood pressure, we call this postural hypotension, right? Uh, except uh, if someone is on diuretic and it's the very senior citizen, elderly and volume depleted, then postural hypertension may occur, right? Then another important point is that diuretics are used in combo with other diuretic, other antihypertensive drugs. As I told you previously, if patient is taking hydralazine, right? Hydralazine has a tendency to retain, activate renin angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism, and lead to retention of salt and water. So with hydralazine, diuretic can be used in com combination, right? Then I've told you, then there are other combinations also. As I told you, diuretics can be used with the beta blockers. Let's suppose you started the patient on diuretic. There, suppose your patient tolerates the diuretics very well, but his blood pressure is not controlled properly. Then what you will add? If there is no contraindication, you will add beta blockers. Let's suppose blood pressure is better controlled than diuretics alone, but still not as good as you want. Then what you will add? You have been giving diuretic, now you have also added the beta blockers, still you are unable to get the desired, desired drop in blood pressure. AC inhibitor, ACE inhibitors, don't tell calcium channel blockers. Good doctors don't combine calcium channel blockers and beta blockers together in one patient. Because if one patient is given beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, both of them may inhibit the heart. They may be dangerously negatively inotropic or negatively chronotropic. Is that right? So again, when patient is on diuretic and you, want, you need to add another antihypertensive, preferably you add beta blockers. But if both of them do not control the hypertension well and you still need to add another drug, you will go for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, not calcium channel blockers. Is that right? Another important, then about the side effects related with thiazides and the mechanism of action, uh, right, you will see all that in lectures related with the diuretics in detail. Now the few words about the beta blockers as antihypertensive agents, again, you will, we will discuss beta blockers in detail, right, in the lectures related with anti-angenal drugs. In anti-angenal drugs, I will discuss the beta blockers in detail. Here, I will just say few basic things related with the beta blockers. Again, when we start discussion about the beta blockers as anti-hypertensive drugs, they are wonderful drug for what, type, what, what group of patients? Young patients and white patients. They respond very well to beta blocker drugs. Secondly, uh, sometimes there are other indications also that with hypertension, maybe supraventricular tachycardia. If patient with hypertension has a tendency for tachycardias, beta blockers are wonderful because they control the ta supraventricular tachycardia as well as they control the hypertension. In the same way, if person is hypertensive and he develops myocardial infarction, so post myocardial infarction, we give the beta blockers. So beta blockers are wonderful for controlling hypertension as well as uh, if you give the patient after the myocardial infarction, they prevent the chances of reinfarction. They reduce the chances of reinfarction. Then another patient where beta blockers are wonderful. Patient with hypertension and angina. Which angina? Classical angina. Right? If a patient comes with uh, hypertension and classical angina, again beta blockers should be the first line of drug. Then patient with migraineous headache. You know beta blockers, propranolol is effective in controlling the migraineous headache. So if patient has hypertension and migraine, again beta blockers are the first line of drugs. And we'll discuss beta blockers in detail uh, in, drug, in lectures related with anti-angenal drugs. One thing which I would love to mention here, that if you put the patient on the beta blockers for a long time, never stop beta blockers abruptly. Because if you have given beta blockers for a very long time, it means you are blocking the beta-1 receptors on the heart. Let's suppose these are the beta-1 receptors. If you are keeping them blocked for a long time, the myocardial tissue 
expresses extra receptors. Is that right? And of course, you give some extra drug and keep them blocked. So when you give the beta blockers in the, for the long time, then what really happens that tissue on which beta 1 receptors are blocked, those tissues express extra receptors. And if you abruptly block the, uh, stop the drug, then you can say tissue due to excessive expression of receptor is oversensitized to endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine and heart will go wild, right? That may precipitate hypertensive attack or even ischemic heart disease. Am I clear? So beta blockers should not be stopped abruptly after long term use, right? They can be tapered off gradually. Then we come to the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, right? Again. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are discussed in detail in the lecture related with congestive drugs used in congestive cardiac failure. When you will watch the videos related with the congestive cardiac failure management, we have discussed in detail angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors as well as we have discussed in detail uh, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Right? Then we move to the next, next group that is calcium channel blocker. And again there is a good news. The calcium channel blockers we have already discussed in detail in anti-angenal drugs, right? So that was all about these groups and other anti-hypertensive drugs we'll discuss in the next session. Right, so we were talking about anti-hypertensive drugs and right now we will discuss about centrally acting sympatholytic drugs as antihypertensive agents, right? Centrally acting sympatholytic agents. Centrally acting, yes, sympatho, sympatholytic agents as antihypertensive drugs, right? Mechanism of action we have already discussed that such drugs basically work in the central nervous system especially in the brain stem and within the brain stem or medulla where there are vasomotor centers right in these centers actually right these drugs what the, what is their mechanism of action they stimulate presynaptic they stimulate these drugs stimulate presynaptic alpha 2 receptors Presynaptic alpha 2 receptors, when they are stimulated, they give inhibitory signal to the sympathetic nerve endings and there is reduced output of neurotransmitter and norepinephrine. Due to this reason, when you give centrally acting sympatholytic agents, they, st uh, they reduce the total sympathetic outflow. And how they reduce blood pressure, we have already discussed. They are centrally acting sympatholytic drug, stimulate the alpha 2 receptors in the central nervous system, especially in the brain stem in the vasomotor centers which are present in the reticular formation, right? And when those nerve endings are stimulated, right, presynaptic nerve endings are stimulated through their alpha 2 receptors, is that right? There is reduced release of norepinephrine and eventually uh, total sympathetic outflow is reduced. It means sympathetic stimulation to the heart and sympathetic stimulation to the blood vessels both is reduced. And how that will bring blood pressure down? You know it very well by now that when sympathetic stimulation to heart is reduced, heart rate goes down, contra cardiac contractility goes down, cardiac output goes down and eventually they are translated into reduced systolic blood pressure. And when sympathetic stimulation to the vessel is reduced, then veins and arterioles both dilate and of course when veins dilate, venous pooling, uh, there is venous increase, venous pooling of blood and preload on the heart is reduced because venous return is reduced, systolic blood pressure come down and when arterioles dilate due to reduced sympathetic outflow that will lead to reduction in diastolic blood pressure. This is what you already know. Can you tell me the name of the drugs which are centrally acting agents? Yes please. I am about to be impressed by you guys. Number one is alpha methyl dopa. Is that right? And then there are, there is, yes, clonidine. And then there are two more drugs that at least you must know. Yeah, you must know two more drugs which act as centrally acting sympatholytic agents. One is guanabens and guanfacine. Guanabens and guanfacine. 
right? All of these are centrally acting sympatholytic agents. Is that right? Now, when we let's talk about clonidine first, right? Clonidine. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Number one, you should remember clonidine or other centrally acting sympatholytic agents are not considered first line antihypertensive drugs these days. Is that right? We have better drugs and safe drug. Uh, diuretics are much better drugs, right? As antihypertensives. Beta blockers are much better drugs. ACE inhibitors are wonderful drugs, right? So that is why uh, centrally acting sympatholytic drugs are not considered these days as first line antihypertensive agents, right? But if the uh, if first line agents are either producing some side effects or due to certain reasons they are contraindicated, then we may revert to use of these drugs. They produce a very important problem that all the centrally acting sympatholytic drugs, right, they lead to salt and water retention as a compensatory mechanism. How? Who will tell me? Actually, they will dilate the blood vessels, right? Then blood going to the kidney will be more or less. If all the blood vessels dilate and blood pressure fall, then perfusion pressure to kidney is reduced. And when there is less blood flow passing through the kidney, then glomerular filtration is more or less. When glomerular filtration is less, then, then fluid is passing very, very slowly through proximal convoluted tubules and proximal convoluted tubules act on the slowly passing luminal fluid more efficiently and reabsorb salt and water. Is that right? So all the centrally acting agents, they lead to retention of salt and water. That is why that they are preferably used in combination with diuretics. Right? All the centrally acting agents have a tendency to retain salt and water and that is why that they are used in combination with, yes, diuretics. Is that right? Now, another thing which is important is that these drugs have many other side effects. For example, these drugs produce sedation. Why? They actually interfere with the receptors and brain stem related with the ascending reticular formation system. In the brain stem there is ascending reticular formation which controls your uh, level of uh, consciousness and that controls your level of alertness and control the sleep and wakefulness cycle. Do you know exactly where is ascending reticular formation? Here is your brain stem and here is your ascending reticular formation which can stimulate all the cerebral cortex. Of course, uh, ascending reticular formation passes through intralaminar nuclei of the thalamus, right? And it controls the level of alertness. So all those drugs which inhibit the reticular formation, they will produce some degree of drowsiness. Is it difficult to understand? No. So it's all centrally acting sympatholytic drugs because sympathetic activity in the reticular formation make you alert. You know, whenever you have increased sympathetic activity, you are more alert or less alert? You are more alert. So if there is sympatholytic activity, you will be less alert, right? So all these drugs classically produce sedation and drowsiness, is that right? Then, unfortunately, these drugs also interfere with the salivatory nuclei in the brain stem. In the brain stem, there are special nuclei which control the salivary gland output, right? So those salivatory nuclei are also inhibited. Even lacrimatory nucleus is also inhibited. So these patients may develop, yes, dry mouth, dry mouth, even dry nose and even dry eyes. Is that right? That is another unwanted action of these drugs that while acting centrally, they inhibit the salivatory as well as lacrimatory nucleus in the brain stem and that translates into dryness in the mouth, in the eyes and nose and that situation whole is called zero. Stomia, especially zero stomia mean dry mouth. Is that right? Then these drugs can produce impotence, right? Of course, a male who is all the time drowsy and dizzy and uh, right, uh, with that he has his sympathetic system inhibited, right? So especially central sympathetic switches are inhibited, then uh, he may become important as well. How do you de define potency? 
because many drugs produce impotence. Beta blockers, antihypertensive drugs also produce impotence. Alpha blockers may also produce impotence. These centrally acting sympathetic drugs may also produce impotence. You don't know the definition of potency. It's very sad. It's very simple that uh, it is inability to, pro to maintain enough erection in the male organ to have satisfactory penetration in the female, of course in vagina, right? Now, so this may lead to, I don't know why you are laughing, you are happy with the definition or you are happy with the impotency, <laughs> right? Oh, even he is happy. Why you have so much concern in the impotence? You are taking these drugs? Right. So, uh, this is very important from patient viewpoint. Uh, there are many middle aged uh, men who, who are given beta blockers as anti hypertensive drugs or beta blockers may be used as anti general drugs, right? Many of them really have a very poor compliance because very soon they discover that with beta, blo beta blockers, they are not only physically fatigued very frequently or they are mentally depressed, even they become important. Is that right? Now, let's come back. So, I was talking about that even with these drugs, you can produce. Uh, patient may develop dizziness. Why patient may develop dizziness or vertigo? What could be the reason? It's very simple, right? Because most of the veins are dilated, blood is pulling in the peripheral area, return to the heart is less, cardiac output is less, maybe sometimes cardiac output is so less that enough cerebral perfusion cannot be maintained or enough perfusion to the vestibular nuclei in the brainstem may not be maintained and that may precipitate dizziness or vertigo. Right? Then the last thing but very very important thing that if you really put a patient on these drugs, centrally acting sympathetic drugs for a long time, then never stop the drugs abruptly. Never uh, stop the drug abruptly. This is a basic principle that for most, for example, it is any cell in the body and this cell has some special type of receptors. It's a general principle. If you give some drug which blocks these receptors, then receptor activity, receptor signal to the cell are increased or decreased? They are decreased. So, genes are activated to produce more receptors. So, what really happens that most of the drugs which are receptor blockers, if they are used for a long time, then cells overexpress the receptors. We say cells become hypersensitized, super sensitized. Is that right? So, in such patient, if you uh, drop the, stop the drug, what will happen? Overstimulation. Overstimulation. So what really happens that uh, in these patients who are, who are having the drugs for long term, uh, centrally sympatholytic drugs, as if you abruptly stop the drugs, then central mechanisms of vasomotor system become overstimulated and patient develops severe rebound of hypertension. Sympathetic system overwork, overfires. Is that right? So that may produce rebound hypertension. That is why that patient who are on the long term centrally acting sympathetic drugs, even patient who are on the long term beta blocker drugs, you should not stop the drugs abruptly. It's better and wise to gradually stop the drug. Is that right? Then alpha methyl dopa has some special side effects. Of course, it has all other side effects like uh, alpha methyl dopa also retains salt and water. Alpha methyl dopa also uh, produces drowsiness and dizziness and sedation, right? But there are two special side effects related with alpha methyl dopa. Uh, one is that in some patients it may produce hepatitis, inflammation in the liver, some allergic reaction by the drug, right? And this uh, hepatitis may be life threatening. That is why that some doctors when they start the patient on alpha methyl dopa every three, uh, in, after starting the drug three to four weeks after that they check the hepatic enzymes in the blood of course they check what is the level of uh, transaminases or gamma glutamyl transferases number one number two alpha methyl dopa in some patients when it is used it may lead to positive Coombs test what is Coombs test have you heard of it or never heard of it you have heard of it, Combs test. What about you? You have heard of it also. What is Combs test? It is something like comb? That you give the comb to the patient and see that uh, they can comb their, their hair or not or what? Combs test. Heard of it? Okay, let me tell you rapidly. Listen. 
forget about that drug right now. Let's concentrate what I'm telling you. Let's suppose this is your RBCs. Is that right? Sometimes when there's autoimmune hemolytic anemia, then again on the RBCs, there may be autoantibodies. bodies. Sometimes our body make autoantibodies bodies against the antigens on the surface of RBCs, then your RBCs will be coated by autoantibodies. bodies. Is that right? Now, Combs test is a test to determine that your RBCs are coated with autoantibodies bodies or not. Combs test is a test to determine that your RBCs are coated or covered with the autoantibodies bodies or not. How we, what we really do, this is your friend, this is an animal, okay, very happy one. We inject this animal with human antibodies. What are these? Human antibodies, for example, RB antibodies against RBCs, we inject to this animal. Do you think this animal will take these human antibodies as self or non-self? Non-self. So, anti, so, animal will make antibodies, animal immune system will make antibodies against human antibodies. So, animal will develop in his circulation antibodies directed against human antibodies. Human antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. So, animal makes anti immunoglobulins. Animal is making anti immunoglobulins and these can be separated. Let's suppose uh, these are from animal extracted. What are these? These are anti immunoglobulins. This bottle which is having anti immunoglobulins, this is called Coombs reagent. Coombs reagent. Whenever you want to check that some RBCs are having autoantibodies or not, you put the Coombs reagent on that. If RBC is having immunoglobulins, then Coombs antibodies will bind with that. Is that right? And then may lead to agglutination of the RBCs, which are coated with the antibodies. But do you think these antibodies will bind with this RBC? No. Is that right? So, this is called Coombs test. What is the Coombs test? Coombs test is a test in which we do, we use animal derived anti immunoglobulins, right, to determine the presence of immunoglobulins on our RBCs. It's a difficult test, right? So many patients, about 10% of the patients who are put on the alpha methyl dopa for long term, they may, be, may develop positive Coombs test. And some of them may develop even severe hemolytic anemia. And then you have to withdraw the drug. Am I clear? Right? So this was about uh, centrally acting sympatholytic drugs. Now a few words about the Alpha adrenoreceptor, alpha receptor blockers. We have discussed already that alpha receptor blockers, which are uh, preferably used as antihypertensive drugs, are prazosin, prazosin, and doxazosin. Did we discuss that? Right now, alpha blockers. Alpha blockers as antihypertensives are quite successful agents. Right? What alpha blocker blockers are doing? They are blocking the alpha 1 receptors on the arterioles and veins. So, arterioles will relax as well as veins will relax. Right? And that will translate into lower blood pressure. Is that right? We have discussed the mechanism in last lectures. Now, alpha blocker drugs, right? Usually they are you, they have a two side effects which, which are produced. Rather, you should remember as a basic concept that most of the drugs will dilate the vessels they produce two side effects. Suppose any drug which produce vasodilation, that will produce two types of compensatory mechanism. Number one, vasodilatation may produce reflex, reflex uh, uh, sympathetic overflow, right? That may lead to reflex sympathetic overflow. And symp uh, reflex sympathetic overflow may lead to cardio stimulation. That may lead to, yes, please, cardio stimulation. And that cardio stimulation is going into increased heart rate plus increased stroke volume due to increased contractility. Because when sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, we say there is positive coronotropic action. Coronotropic action. And when sympathetic nervous system increases contractility, we say there is positive inotropic action. And both of these things eventually lead to, yes, increase cardiac output and increase systolic blood pressure. It means whenever we are using uh, vasodilator drugs, right, 
they have a tendency to activate the cardiac stimulation and cardio stimulation uh, may try to counter the and neutralize the benefit of vasodilators number 2 when vasodilators are used right renal blood flow may reduce either that activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone access or if renal blood flow is reduced that simply reduces gfr and when gfr is reduced then proximal convoluted tubule reabsorb yes plays more salt and water and renin angiotensin aldosterone system through distal tubule may lead to increase reabsorption of salt and water so there are two ways that whenever you use the strong vasodilators right by reducing the blood flow to kidney number one they can reduce the gfr number two they can reduce the they can stimulate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system right renin angiotensin aldosterone system when it is activated increase aldosterone can act on the uh, principal cells of the late part of the nephron and reabsorb more salt and water and when gfr is reduced glomerular filtration is reduced then fluid suppose if gfr is reduced right if gfr is reduced then very little fluid is passing through the lumen and proximal convoluted tubule cells have more chance to work on slowly moving fluid and reabsorb more salt and water but if fluid moves rapidly they have less chance to reabsorb salt and water this is a very important compensatory mechanism the biological system try to counter the effects of vasodilatory antihypertensive agents am i clear of course when the salt and water is retained the blood volume is increased venous return is increased and cardiac output is increased is that right now why i told you all this thing because if you are using alpha blockers as vasodilators then you must use with that some other drugs to counter these effects for example uh, alpha blockers are more effective when they are used in combination with diuretics alpha blockers are more uh, effective when they are used in combination with yes please in combination with diuretics right then alpha blockers can also be used in combination with beta blockers also right so that cardio stimulation can be prevented any question up to this and of course later on when we will discuss very powerful vasodilators what are the powerful vasodilators that is your hydralazine minoxidil lipitolol uh, okay rather direct vasodilator are hydralazine hydralazine then there is minoxidil and diazoxide and nitroprusside right nitroprusside is uh, used mainly in emergencies so these three drugs hydralazine minoxidil and diazoxide they strongly stimulate the cardiac system and they strongly lead to salt and water retention that is why as a group these drugs should be used with diuretics and beta blockers it's a basic principle could you understand why it is so right after this uh, then we come to the side effect related with the alpha blockers a lot of side effects when alpha receptors are blocked number one that may lead to nasal stuffiness right because they are vessels in the nasal mucosa which are kept constricted by the alpha receptor activity but when alpha receptors are blocked vessels dilate and produce increased blood flow to nasal mucosa and that may develop swelling and increased secretion in nasal mucosa translating into nasal stuffiness then alpha receptor uh, blockers may also lead to orthostatic hypotension is that right that may produce orthostatic hypotension or which is also called postural hypotension is that right because such person who is on alpha blocker when from lying down position he suddenly stand up sympathetic system cannot really lead to constriction of veins as alpha 1 receptors on the veins are blocked is that right and veins remain dilated and blood pools into lower part of the body right and cardiac output venous return reduces cardiac output reduces and there's a postural drop in the blood along with that there may be blackouts and dizziness and vertigo am i clear right then alpha blocker also produce uh, sexual dysfunction because alpha 1 receptors are involved in ejaculatory process in male remember that erection is parasympathetic activity and ejaculation is 
sympathetic activity. So all the drugs uh, which inhibit the sympathetic nervous system may produce sexual dysfunction, right? As a then we can talk about, the, there's one thing good about that, not everything bad about alpha blockers. The good thing in alpha blocker as antihypertensive agents is that they don't disturb the lipid profile of the patient, which is normally disturbed by beta blockers and diuretics unfavorably. Beta blockers and diuretics disturb the lipid profile of the patient unfavorably. Is that right? Uh, but these drugs, they don't produce any adverse effect on the lipid profile in the patient. And you know, lipid profile is very important in the patient with hypertension because hyperlipidemia also increases atherosclerotic layons as well as hypertension also increases atherosclerotic layons. Now, let's talk about directly acting vasodilators very briefly, right? We shall talk about directly acting vasodilators. Already we have discussed that directly acting vasodilators are hydralazine, minoxidil, is that right? Hydralazine, minoxidil and diazoxide. We will discuss in detail hydralazine and minoxidil. First hydralazine. So male or female? When we talk about hydralazine, you have to remember this diagram and put hydralazine start with H. So put an H here. What does it mean? What is this? What this H is telling you? Hydralazine produces a very unusual side effect. Lupus like syndrome. Hydralazine produces lupus like syndrome. If you really do not want to remember like this, just put a H over here. Is that right? On the side of the nose, there are lions. These are called lupus like syndrome. So, very special side effect of hydralazine. Is that right? Now, let us talk about hydralazine. It is a very powerful. Uh, vasodilator, especially arteriolodilator. And of course, there is no fun in explaining because it is powerful arteriolodilator. It will lead to reflex cardio stimulation and lead to salt and water retention. So, it should be used preferably in combination with diuretics to prevent the salt and water retention and it should be preferably used with beta blockers to prevent the reflex cardio stimulation. Is that right? And this is very important again because when you use hydralazine alone, vessels dilate massively and there is reflex sympathetic overflow and this reflex sympathetic overflow may precipitate even angina in some patient who have long term hypertension or it may produce so severe tachycardia that patient may develop myocardial infarction if he has a coronary artery disease already or in some patient it may precipitate congestive cardiac failure. So those patients who are hypertensive and having a tendency for angina or myocardial infarction of congestive cardiac failure, it is wise not to use hydralazine or any strong vasodilator, right? Because it may precipitate severe cardio, cardio, cardio stimulation through reflex sympathetic activity enhancement. Or if you are compelled to use hydralazine, you should be wise enough to use some beta blocker with that. Is that clear? Right. So, about the hydralazine, what are its major side effects? Number one, some side effects are simple extension of its pharmacological action. So, very powerful arterial load dilator. All the powerful vasodilator leads severe headache. You know why the vasodilator leads to severe headache? Do you have any idea? It's very simple, let me tell you. Let's suppose that this is your cranial cavity and these are foramina and through these foramina vessels are coming in and out. Is that right? Now what really happens that there is a dura mater sleeve, you know there is a dura mater sleeve around these blood vessels. Am I clear? Now, so blood vessels when they are passing through arteries, when they are passing through the foramen of the skull, they are having a dural sleeve 
and in this dural sleeve here are the pain receptors what are these pain receptors these dural sleeves at these points are very very rich in pain receptor whenever you use a strong arteriolodilator arteries will dilate strongly and beat the and hammer the dura mater against the bone and that will produce throbbing headache headache with every pulse right that is why most of the vasodilator they produce severe throbbing headache is that right is it difficult to understand right so hydralazine or minoxidil or diazoxide or other strong vasodilators they may produce headache secondly they can produce flushing when skin vessels are dilated that may produce flushing not blushing what is the difference in flushing and blushing what blushing is an emotional response vasodilatation due to some emotional thing as you know sometimes uh, some females blush under certain circumstances but these days they just put on blush on right so blushing is emotional vasodilatation some part of the body especially on the cheeks right uh, but flushing is generalized arterial dilatation for example uh, cutaneous arterial dilatation for example by the alcohol some people when they take alcohol many skin vessels are dilated they look somewhat reddish is that, is that true or not so that is not blushing that is flushing is that right in the same way many arterial dilator also produce flushing so there may be severe headache with arterial dilator vaso dilators there may be flushing with that there may be orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension is that right then uh, very severe vasodilatation may precipitate reflex tachycardia and palpitations is that right right so these are for, uh, and if blood uh, if uh, blood going to uh, due to strong vasodilatation blood flow to the brain is less patient may develop dizziness or vertigo so all these are the side effects due to pharmacological excessive pharmacological actions of the drug right that may they, these side effects may be seen with hydralazine may be seen with minoxidil may be seen with the diazoxide and may be seen with any other strong vasodilator right but there are some special side effects which are related with the uh, hydralazine right uh, especially that side effect is lupus like syndrome this is an autoimmune tendency we don't know why but they believe that hydralazine interferes with the function of the t cells and modifies some of our antigens and they become immunogens and our immune system start producing antibodies against our own tissues right uh, most common immunological side effect which is produced by hydralazine is lupus like syndrome usually the syndrome is produced after more than 6 6 month of use of the drug and this syndrome is more common in the females this is more common in the patient who are taking high doses of the drug and it is more common uh, in the people who are taking the drug for longer duration the good news is that that this is reversible if you stop the drug most of the patient lupus like syndrome reverses am i clear another important thing related with the hydralazine is yeah another important thing related with the hydralazine is what is that can you tell me hydralazine is catabolized in our body by special enzymes which do acetylation of the drug right there are special enzymes in the gat and in the liver which lead to acetylation of the drug and convert the drug into inactive metabolite is that right so we can say very important catabolic biotransformation pathway or you can say inactivation pathway for the hydralazine is acetylation now important news this is very important clinically usually i don't talk about the drugs and their handling in the body especially but here it is important because some people in usa half population is fast acetylator and half of the population is slow acetylator because some people have more acetylating capacities and other people have lesser acetylating capacity right some people have more enzymes some people have less enzymes so people who are fast acetylator we need to give them they catabolize the drug very rapidly we have to give them little more dose and people who are slow acetylator they catabolize the drug slowly we have to give them a little less dose secondly uh, drug uh, lupus like syndrome will be more common in the patient with slow acetylation or fast acetylation slow acetylation because people who are slow acetylator they will keep the drug into active form and you can say that when drug is present in the body for longer time in higher concentration the more chances the patient will develop lupus like syndrome is that right 
Any question up to this? Again, hydrolysin should be used in combination with beta blockers and diuretics. Then we come to another drug that is minoxidil. Minoxidil is very strong vasodilator or arteriolodilator, right? Minoxidil. Minoxidil for M, is that right? Minoxidil. Is that right? The very special effect of minoxidil is, what is this? It is producing hair. Minoxidil produces hair. We call it hypertrichosis. Special side effect of minoxidil is hypertrichosis. And of course, men are very happy with it. That it produces excessive hair, especially when there's male type of baldness. And it produces more hair on the arm and leg than chest. But of course, the women are least happy with this drug. Is that right? They don't like to look that way. So, this minoxidil should not be used in females. You understand why, right? Uh, they, uh, this is a very, very unusual side effect of minoxidil that it produces hypertrichosis and males have taken advantage of this situation. You know what they have done? They have produced some special topical application, they apply on their head and then the hair starts growing. Is that right? Only thing is that sometimes when they become very enthusiastic, they put extra dose on the head and rub it too much and too much drug goes in the body and they develop hypertension. Is that right? That is the side effect of that. Uh, anyway. Minoxidil is a wonderful drug that it produces, it activates the potassium channels in smooth muscles. And you know if potassium channels in smooth muscles are activated, then a lot of potassium will go out and they will become hyperpolarized negatively. And then smooth muscle stimulation become difficult and vessels become relaxed, right? So this is the main mechanism of action of minoxidil. Side effects, very easy to understand, like hydralazine. Many of its side effects are just simple extension of its, its pharmacological actions. That it produces excessive vasodilatation, that may lead to hypotension, that may lead to postural drop, that may lead to flushing, that may lead to severe headache. Is that right? And there may be reflex uh, cardio stimulation which may precipitate uh, palpitations and that may precipitate ischemic heart disease or angina if there's a tendency for that, right? And these drugs are again dangerous because they also retain salt and water, right? So they should be used in combination with diuretics to prevent the salt and water retention. And they should be used with beta blockers to prevent the inappropriate cardio stimulation. But pre preferably these drugs should not be used. There are better drugs available. They are only used in minoxidil when there is some very severe hypertension and which is refractory to many other antihypertensive agents. Is that right? Okay, then we come to hypertensive emergency, we will discuss that after the break. Now we will talk about hypertensive emergencies and special use of antihypertensive agents. First of all, what are hypertensive emergencies? People who come with very high blood pressure, right, they are, they are said to be hypertensive having hypertensive emergencies. For example, a person who has systolic blood pressure more than 210 millimeter of mercury or person has diastolic blood pressure more than 150 millimeter of mercury in otherwise healthy person. A patient who, patient who come to you, otherwise he does not have any complication, right? But his systolic blood pressure is more than 210 or diastolic blood pressure more than 150, we should declare the patient as having Hypertensive emergency. This is one clinical situation. Other clinical situation is that any patient who has diastolic blood pressure more than 130 millimeter of mercury and along with that he has any complications. He is not otherwise healthy. He has certain complications, uh, severe complications or target organ injury from the high blood pressure. For example, due to very severe hypertension, patient may have hypertensive encephalopathy. Or patient may have hypertensive retinopathy, especially grade 3 and grade 4 changes in the retina, right, in which he has developed the uh, 
especially papillary edema due to hypertension or patient has developed left ventricular failure due to hypertension or patient has developed hypertension precipitated ischemic heart disease like angina or mi or hypertensive changes due to nephropathy is that right so any patient who has who has his diastolic blood pressure more than 130 and he is otherwise not healthy you know he is very very sad why he may has developed some other complications as well not only blood pressure is very high he may have hypertensive encephalopathy or retinopathy or uh, cardiopathy or nephropathy right so these patients are having emergency right and you have to treat to you have to bring the blood pressure down rapidly but in a controllable fashion remember if you bring someone's blood pressure who is very high rapidly down you may kill the patient let me tell you how before i tell you how to use this drug i must warn you that don't be too effective to bring the blood pressure very rapidly down that may be dangerous for the patient let me tell you how let's suppose this is your central nervous system and patient has severe hypertension now listen when someone has severe hypertension then blood flow when blood pressure is progressively going up how the vessels in the brain respond to progressively increasing blood pressure the cerebral vessels have a mechanism called auto regulation if your blood pressure is going up cerebral vessels start constricting to prevent the overflow to the brain and if your blood pressure is going dangerously down normally cerebral vessels start dilating so that if pressure is less vessels should dilate and still maintain the blood flow again cerebral cerebral vessels show a wonderful mechanism called auto regulation what is the basic concept of auto regulation that cerebral vessel automatically regulate their lumen right to uh, to keep the blood flow to the cerebral system almost constant when your blood pressure is going up vessel start getting narrow and if your blood pressure is going down vessel start going dilated so that in spite of the fluctuations in systemic blood pressure the perfusion of the blood to the central nervous system should be stable and constant is that right now listen when a patient comes to you with very high blood pressure so naturally due to very high blood pressure his cerebral vessels are almost spastic the when patient reaches emergency room and patient has a very high blood pressure then of course due to cerebral auto regulation cerebral vessels will be very very narrow clear now if you you are a wonderful doctor and you give a drug which will rapidly bring the blood pressure down maybe you bring the blood pressure very rapidly down but vessels may not dilate that fast so if blood pressure due to pharmacological treatment if blood pressure become rapidly down but vessels cannot dilate that fastly and vessels remains spastic at the top you have reduced the blood pressure the cerebral perfusion to brain will dangerously reduce blood flow to the brain will dangerously reduce and big areas of the central nervous system undergo infarction right this is the first principle you should learn and keep in your mind before you really start managing the anti hypertensive uh, sorry before you really start managing the hypertensive crises or emergencies again if in hypertensive emergencies you don't treat the patient still vessels go so spastic they may damage the brain and if you bring the blood pressure very rapidly down vasospasticity is not released and still brain damage so what you have to do you have to bring the blood pressure rapidly down but in a very very controllable fashion is that right they say the blood pressure should drop about 25% in first hour and after that further drop should be very very slow under these circumstances we should not give a drug for example patient take an orally drug and it goes in the body and then it precipitously fall the blood pressure that will be a tragedy we would like to give a drug which has a short half life and and drug should be such a way that we can really control minute by minute the blood pressure of the person and we can adjust the dose of the drug or infusion of the drug according and titrate it with the desired blood pressure changes am i clear the most wonderful drug regarding this is sodium nitroprusside what is the drug 
सोडियम नाइट्रो प्रोसाइड इट्स अ वेरी पावरफुल आर्टीरियो एज वेल एज विनो डायलेटर इट इज आर्टीरियो डायलेटर एज वेल एज विनो डायलेटर एक्चुअली वेन जो सोडियम नाइट्रो प्रोसाइड इज गिवन बाय यस प्लीज it is given by special type of continuous continuous venous infusion it is given continuous venous infusion we mix the sodium nitroprusside with some uh, dextrose water and then drop by drop we let it go into venous system is it right the beauty of this drug is that this drug has it started action very rapidly if you have given inject started the infusion here within 30 second it will start bringing the blood pressure down and within 2 minute within 2 minutes it will reach to its peak action right this is 30 second this is 2 minutes it will reach to its peak action and if you stop the drug right now within 3 minutes its action will be down that's the beauty of this drug that this drug when we start intravenously within half minute it starts its action within 2 minute it goes to vasodilatory action peak and if at any moment you stop the drug in less than 3 minutes its action is lost so what we do we don't give a full bolus injection no we give it gradually intravenous infusion of this drug and we keep on measuring the blood pressure on other arm or we put intra arterial catheter to measure the blood pressure so what you what you are doing that you are having your absolute control on the infusion if you feel blood pressure is going down less than desirable rate you can slightly increase the infusion of the drug and if you feel drug blood pressure is going too fast down slightly decrease the infusion so you have minute by minute control on the blood pressure of the patient when you are treating the hypertensive emergency the sodium nitroprusside given as a continuous intravenous infusion is that really clear no problem its mechanism of action i have already mentioned that nitroprusside is taken by the smooth muscle the arteries and veins and then inside those smooth muscle it releases nitric oxide which will stimulate the guanylyl cyclase cyclic gmp will increase you know that and eventually that will lead to vasodilation arteriolo as well as we know there is no fun in telling that when arteriole the dilated of course total peripheral resistance will go down and diastolic blood pressure will be down and when it produces strong veno constriction then naturally venous return to heart is decreased and cardiac output is decreased and systolic blood pressure comes down is that really clear then another important thing is that this drug during its metabolism it produces cyanide ions which is a poison it they produce cyanide this drug releases small amounts of cyanide if cyanide is released more we give injection of thiosulfate what we give thiosulfate and this thiosulfate will convert with the cyanide thiosulfate will convert into thio cyanide cyanate and this thio cyanide will go out through kidney right remember sodium nitroprusside should never be taken orally because in the gat it releases a lot of cyanide and it's a big toxic substance So it is always given intravenously. Another thing, it is photo deactivated. It is very very sensitive. With sunlight, it can be deactivated. So around the vial, they put the silver paper so that it should not be deactivated around it, right? So reflecting paper, fine. So again, what is the most important thing about sodium nitroprusside? Why it is so wonderful drug? Because it starts the action immediately, and its action can be terminated as soon as you stop the within few minutes. when you stop the infusion and this drug gives you a powerful but a very very good control on the patient's blood pressure minute by minute am i clear no problem into this right so after having said all about this sodium nitroprusside of course its major side effect will be hypotension right then we can talk about other drugs which are used in uh, hypertensive crisis one of the wonderful drug another wonderful drug is Labitolol. I will prefer to write labitolol as rather A you write alpha and rather B you write beta. Labitolol. Why I have written like this? Because it's spelling the telling, 
एल फोर लो एक्टिविटी ऑफ अल्फा रिसेप्टर एंड लो एक्टिविटी ऑफ बीटा रिसेप्टर लिबिटोल ऑल इज अल्फा एंड बीटा ब्लॉकर इट ब्लॉक्स अल्फा रिसेप्टर एज वेल एज इट ब्लॉक्स बीटा रिसेप्टर इज द राइट so by blocking the alpha receptors it produces arterial load dilatation and venous dilatation but blocking the beta receptors on the heart it prevent the reflex sympathetic cardio stimulation it's a wonderful anti hypertensive agent it's alpha blocker as well as beta blocker right and of course it does not produce reflex tachycardia you understand why because it's blocking the beta 1 receptors as well then another drug which is used in emergencies is fenolda palm right Phenoldopam. Phenoldopam. This is dopamine one receptor agonist. It is not antagonist. Please remember, this is agonist. D one receptor agonist. And when you give this drug again, it is given intravenously, right? And as an infusion. The beauty of this drug is that not only it uh, brings the blood pressure down, it specially maintains the blood flow to kidney. kidney vessels have loaded with lot of d1 receptors and when they are stimulated vessels undergo dilation right then we can come to and there are many other drugs like nicardepine that can also be given nicardepine is calcium channel blocker that can be given in hypertensive emergencies right then another drug which is given commonly in hypertensive emergencies is diazoxide but usually this drug is used when nitroprusside is not available or better drugs are not available right diazoxide should be given in small boluses not a big large bolus because that may bring the pre precipitous fall in the blood pressure and you are unable to take it upward because such drugs have a slightly longer half life is that right nitroprusside is wonderful it start the action very rapidly and it's a very very short half life is that right so diazoxide is another drug which bring the activate the potassium channels so bring the potassium out of smooth muscles of arteries and veins and eventually lead to specially arteries and lead to hyperpolarization of arterial smooth muscle and vessel arterial load dilatation and bring the blood pressure down uh, it is very successfully used diazoxide in pregnancy induced hypertension which is called preeclampsia and eclampsia right so that's all about the management of hypertensive emergencies in which you have to be very very careful don't be the king who bring the blood pressure very rapidly down and once it is down patient develops infarction in the brain and he cannot bring the blood pressure back is that right you have to use the drug very carefully giving intravenous slow boluses ideally you should use nitroprusside another special use of nitroprusside patient with aortic dissection patient who develop dissection of aorta we give them intravenous infusion of nitroprusside with beta blocker right because we don't want that we should give nitroprusside blood pressure goes down and then reflex tachycardia start and heart start pumping more blood and dissection started once right so rosodium nitroprusside can be given with the beta blockers in the management of acute management of acute management of aortic dissection right that's all about anti hypertensive drugs right someone just ask me that why we use nitroprusside in patient with aortic dissection first of all you should know what is aortic dissection in aortic dissection what really happens that for, for first you understand normally normally blood is moving in the lumen of aorta but in some unfortunate patient blood may cut through the intima and dissect a pathway in the wall of aorta so this we say that uh, a sheet of blood uh, right is dissecting the wall of aorta is that right this is called aortic dissection when a patient is developing aortic dissection it's a big emergency we should bring the blood pressure down if blood pressure is down naturally then the power with which the blood is moving and dissecting the wall of aorta will be reduced and maybe during that you can take the patient to uh, cardiac surgery theater and then he is properly taken care right that is why patient with aortic dissection if uh, sodium nitroprusside is available you should give it immediately so that you keep the blood pressure very very low not dangerously low but significantly low so that uh, aortic dissection should not advance very rapidly am i clear 
but the problem is that when you give uh, your uh, nitroprusside vasodilatation may lead to reflex cardio stimulation and reflex cardio stimulation may increase the cardiac output and again blood may start dissecting so that is why with nitroprusside prusside we must give beta blockers so that uh, sympathetic nervous system should not be able to activate the heart reflexly right and cardiac output remain less so that blood uh, is not able to dissect uh, you can say in a very rapid way through the wall of aorta am i clear that's it welcome